The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. Today's hearing is entitled, Protecting Consumers or Allowing Consumer Abuse, a semi-annual review of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Today, we welcome back Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Director Kathy Craninger for her testimony on the Consumer Bureau's semi-annual report to Congress. Let me just say at the outset that I remain very concerned about Director Craninger's misguided leadership of the Consumer Bureau. Director Craninger, since your confirmation as Consumer Bureau Director, you have undertaken a series of actions that have undermined the Consumer Bureau's mission to protect consumers from harmful financial practices and products. Most recently, I'm appalled by your decision to issue a policy statement that undercuts the Dodd-Frank Act's prohibition on unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. You've made it harder for your own agency to crack down on abusive acts by financial institutions. With this policy statement, you've made it clear that under your watch, bad actors will come first and consumers will come last. Of course, this is consistent with your track record at the Consumer Bureau. So while I'm appalled, I can't say I'm surprised. In fact, at this point, I would be surprised if you actually did something meaningful to protect consumers. You've only been leading the Consumer Bureau for almost 14 months and your track record has been decidedly anti-consumer at that time, in the time that you have had. You delayed and weakened the Consumer Bureau's payday small dollar and car title rule to curb abusive payday loans, issued a debt collection rule that only debt collectors can love because it allows them to engage in abusive debt collection practices with few limits, weakened reporting requirements under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, allowing redlining and discriminatory lending to proliferate undetected, and abandoned the Consumer Bureau's longstanding defense of the constitutionality of its structure as an independent watchdog. You've also eased up on enforcement and supervisory activity, taking a see no evil approach enforcing our nation's consumer protection laws. In some cases, you gave bad actors a free pass by failing to require them to pay any restitution to the consumers they harmed. Under your leadership, it's a great time for bad actors to rip off consumers because you have shown that if they do, you're not going to do anything about it. To add insult to injury as a member of the board of the federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, you voted in favor of a harmful new rule proposed by Comptroller Auding on the implementation of the Community Reinvestment Act that would result in bank disinvestment in communities across the country. I should not need to remind you, Director Craninger, that Congress created the Consumer Bureau as a stalwart watchdog to protect consumers from the types of harmful, abusive, of practices that caused the 2008 financial crisis and led to economic catastrophe. America needs a strong consumer bureau that is vigilant and effective. America needs better from you. Today, members of this committee will be scrutinizing and asking tough questions about the actions you have taken. This committee will continue to shine a light on the Trump administration's anti-consumer activities and we will continue to conduct rigorous oversight of the Consumer Bureau. I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes for an opening statement. 
Well, uh, thank you, Director Kraniger, for being here today. And I'd like to first say thank you um, for your commitment to uh, an uh, open process, to fairness, to the rule of law. I think this is uh, a long time coming for this bureau. Uh, though the structure is still um, uh, a very poor one as a result of Dodd-Frank, thank you for, for trying to clear this up as best you can given the circumstances. Since Dodd-Frank's enactment, Republicans have expressed serious concern over the structure of the CFPB. That remains. Our concerns are driven by the fear that Congress has created one of the most powerful, unaccountable, and unconstitutional bureaucracies ever. Our concerns are driven by the funding scheme, which comes only from the Fed without oversight of Congress, uh, a lack of an inspector general uh, who, is uh, who is solely focused on the Bureau's activity, uh, and uh, focus on eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse wherever it may be. Our concerns are driven by a director who can only be removed by the president for cause. Those things remain. Uh, we saw the disastrous results of this unaccountable agency's actions firsthand, and that was under former Director Cordray's regime. The limitless, unaccountable authority bestowed upon the director resulted in small businesses, community banks, and others being bullied through arbitrary enforcement actions, pure arbitrary enforcement actions, uh, unilateral enforcement actions that were the modus operandi of the Bureau under the previous leadership. However, under new leadership, under this director's leadership, uh, they've made necessary and appropriate changes to the way the Bureau functions. That is good. For example, the Bureau uh, finally provided a long-needed clarification uh, for the, the abusiveness standard in its supervision and in, uh, enforcement work. Uh, the Dodd-Frank added, um, uh, Dodd added the word abusive uh, to enforcement authority uh, to the existing statute, unfair and deceptive acts and practices, uh, which we call UDAP. Um, and while there are statutory definitions for unfair and deceptive, until recently the Bureau was working under a vague and fluid definition for abusive. That's problematic. It's problematic for those people you regulate. Uh, the policy clarification that you've brought forward is helpful. That clarity uh, will help focus future cases and, and uh, future um, actions by the Bureau around something that is quantifiable. In addition, I support the, fe this, uh, the federal financial regulatory agency's efforts to address and expand the use of alternative data and underwriting. Um, I know uh, there are also uh, consumer protection concerns with uh, changing underwriting standards. Uh, we debated uh, this on the House floor just last week, in fact. I share the view that regulators should ensure that firms understand uh, the responsibility to use alternative sources of data in a manner consistent with consumer protection laws. Finally, I want to commend the Bureau on its recent announcement to work with the Department of Education to help student borrowers particularly those borrowers who are having problems in the process. Uh, working together to better support students is a win-win for the student and for the agencies and the taxpayer. But the fact remains, while we've seen more transparency over the last several years than we've seen since the inception of the Bureau, uh, the structure of this agency still alarms me. It's run by a single individual with no real oversight or accountability. I am grateful that you're here today for your annual testimony. I am hopeful that you will follow and comply with the rule of law, um, and I'm grateful that you have. Uh, but I understand the structure is so limited uh, in terms of what we can do uh, to have oversight of your bureau. So I wish you well. I hope you comply with the law, and I hope that uh, you, you uh, continue to follow the structure as best you can. And so with that, look forward to the questions. I now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, Mr. Meeks, for one minute. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters. The agency was named Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for a reason. It is to protect consumers. Consumers deserve a regulator who advocates solely for their interests and acts against abusive companies. This stands in stark contrast to what I am seeing from the administration's CFPB leadership. Instead of implementing common sense rules, starkly limiting payday loans, the CFPB is postponing crucial regulations. 
Rather than ramping up enforcement against bad actors, the agency has reduced the number of enforcement actions from 54 in 2015 to an average of 17.5 in 2018 and 2019. And whereas the FHFA has defended its constitutionality in court, Director Kreninger has forfeited this responsibility and abdicated her duty to protect consumers. The CFPB has swerved away from its core mission of protecting consumers. This must change. I yield back. I now recognize the ranking member on the subcommittee, Mr. Luca Meyer, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Kraninger, for testifying here today. In my previous life, one of the jobs I had was a banking regulator. I can tell you that any sound regulatory or supervising, supervisory regime has to, take, has to have a balance to it. On one hand, you must help businesses and entities comply with all the rules and regulations, while on the other hand, ensuring that any truly bad actors are reprimanded. For too long, under the previous administration, the CFPB was used solely to threaten and attack financial entities. I applaud the job you've been doing in reeling in this power and bringing back a responsible regulatory approach to the Bureau. One example of common sense reforms that has come out of the CFPB is a proposed change to CFPB's UDAP authority specifically how the Bureau will, will apply the term abusive. I've been fighting this vague term and, and punitive term for years and even introduced legislation in 2016 to remove it altogether, conducting a cost-benefit analysis and encouraging entities to comply with the abusive standard before seeking monetary relief is the types of common sense relief reforms the CFPB is lacking for quite some time. I applaud your approach and look forward to uh, discussing with you other issues today. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. I now want to welcome to the committee our witness, the Honorable Kathy Craninger. Director Craninger has testified before the committee previously and I believe needs no further introduction. So without objection, your written testimony will be made a part of the record. You will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. At that time, I would ask you to wrap up your testimony so we can be respectful of the committee member's time. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to provide our semi-annual update on the Bureau's important work. It is my honor and privilege to serve and protect American consumers. To best achieve our mission for consumers, the Bureau is focused on preventing harm in the first place. We prevent harm by building a culture of compliance throughout the financial system while supporting free and competitive markets that provide for informed consumer choice. My remarks this morning will largely focus on key recent actions the Bureau has taken to protect consumers. To start, earlier this week, the Bureau and the Department of Education announced a new memorandum of understanding regarding consumer complaints about private and federal student loans. The MOU will better serve America's students by allowing for subject matter experts from both agencies to work together to more efficiently resolve complaints. The staff of both agencies will meet regularly to discuss trends they are observing, including the nature of the complaints received, the characteristics of borrowers, and available information about resolution of complaints. The staff of the Department of Education will have the same near real-time access to the Bureau's complaint database that other government partners have, the MOU also provides for the sharing of analysis, recommendations, and data analytics tools. I am confident that this increased collaboration will better protect consumers and result in better resolutions for students. In addition, the Bureau will soon launch a revamped tool aimed at helping students understand their financial aid packages. The Paying for College Toolkit will help prospective students with financial aid offers to better understand the terms of their loan and then be able to put together a financing plan to cover the remaining cost of attendance. By helping students understand their financial aid package, we are enabling them to make better informed financial decisions today and putting them in a better position for their financial future. Another way the Bureau aims to protect consumers is by issuing clear rules of the road. Specifically, I want to point out our efforts on the QM patch. As you know, the Bureau issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking last year that reiterated the patch was intended to and will expire. After reviewing public comments, we have decided to propose to amend the QM rule by moving away from the 43% debt-to-income ratio requirement. 
Instead, the Bureau would propose an alternative, such as pricing threshold, to better ensure that responsible, affordable mortgage credit remains available to consumers. While we are moving forward with rulemaking, we would welcome legislation through which Congress could better weigh the important policy objectives at issue. Finally, we prevent harm by using supervision and enforcement to promote compliance with the law. To be effective, the Bureau must be consistent and transparent about our expectations of such compliance. To that end, the Bureau recently announced our policy providing a common sense framework on how we intend to apply the abusiveness standard in supervision and enforcement matters. For too long, this has been a gray area creating uncertainty and hampering consumer beneficial innovation. Moving forward, the Bureau intends to cite or challenge abusive conduct when the harm to consumers exceeds the benefits. When alleging abusiveness violations, we intend to clearly demonstrate the nexus between cited facts and our legal analysis in a way that supports the development of the meets and bounds of abusive acts and practices as distinguished from unfair and deceptive acts and practices. Further, we intend to seek certain types of monetary relief only when the entity has failed to make a good faith effort at compliance. Restitution for consumers will be the priority in these cases. Before closing, let me note an important effort led by our Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. The Bureau has conducted outreach to mortgage finance organizations to assess the diversity and inclusion practices of the entities we regulate. The outreach strategy was multi-pronged to engage entities to participate in the voluntary self-assessment process. From that process, the Bureau has developed an online data collection tool to collect and manage the submitted assessment data. That tool is now available on the Bureau's website. Appropriate protection of the data provided will be critical to the success of this initiative. Again, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the Bureau's important work to protect consumers and put them first, as well as hold bad actors accountable. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Following the financial crisis more than a decade ago, mm -hmm. Congress determined that consumer financial protection needed a major upgrade. <clears throat> when we created the CFPB, both with respect to the rules of the road, but also which agency was tasked with enforcing the law and protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. Director Kraninger, <clears throat> Before the CFP was created, do you know which federal agency was the Consumer Financial Protection Watchdog? Congresswoman, the responsibilities prior to the Dodd-Frank Act were distributed, um, both at the federal level and certainly at the state level. And many of those agencies retained some of those authorities, the prudential regulators, the Federal Trade Commission, and as, as noted, the state's uh, attorneys general, uh, banking regulators at the state level and other regulators in the financial services space at the state level. So <clears throat> you do understand that it was generally shared between six federal agencies, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, Office of the Control of the Currency, Office of Thrift Supervision, the National Credit Union Administration. Which of those agencies do you think did the best job of protecting consumers? Congresswoman, I, I don't want to speak for the things that happened before, but I will say it's certainly Congress's conclusion in uh, the Dodd-Frank Act and the actions taken that there was a need for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, to really uh, help coordinate and oversee compliance, at least within the financial services sector. But so, we continue so to <coughs> hold very close partnerships with the other federal agencies and certainly with the states. So you do believe, however, that there was a need uh, for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I, I believe that Congress set out the mission very clearly for this agency. I take that mission very seriously, and I endeavor to do uh, carry out the law and, and carry out our responsibilities supporting so do, the staff. You do believe that there was a need to establish the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Is that what you're saying? Chairwoman, I would say it is very clear that Congress determined that, and my job is to carry out the law and to carry out the important responsibilities that Congress gave to this agency 
in addition to overseeing the many staff okay. that are dedicated to this mission. So despite what you believe, because you won't say that you believe there was a need for it, despite what you believe, you believe that since you have the job, you're gonna do what the job <coughs> is I supposed to be all about. Thank you. Thank you. Do you believe your predecessor, Director Cordray, fulfilled the agency's purpose to be a strong watchdog for consumers? I believe that Director Cordray absolutely took seriously the oath that he took, uh, that I took, uh, that he was seeking to carry out the agency's mission um, with the best, think the best of his ability and to his understanding. You. Do you think he did a good job? I, I think he absolutely carried out the things that he intended to carry out. So, and I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna levy judgment. I, Congresswoman, you know that I have not done that all right, in well, general. Thank, thank you thing. very much. Yes. Uh, I, would, I would think that you would know whether or not uh, he carried out the mandate uh, for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Do you know how much uh, he um, obtained? Uh, for consumers through enforcement actions? Chairwoman, certainly the enforcement powers that we have are important. That includes getting the best remedies possible uh, in the interest of justice. That includes restitution, which I guess uh, is where you're going with Do you know how much he was able to? Restitution and civil money penalties are two different uh, means, but there are certainly millions of dollars uh, in both. And Let me just remind you that Cordray's leadership obtained for consumers through enforcement actions $12 billion for 30 million consumers. So I think that's important for you to know uh, because I would suspect that you want to um, make some determination about whether or not uh, you're able to have uh, the same kind of strong uh, consumer protection actions that he had, and whether or not you're able to return to consumers who have been harmed uh, the kind of restitution that they deserve. And so, uh, under your leadership during the past year, the CFPB has a laundry list of unhelpful actions, including a troubling decline in consumer financial protection enforcement actions, especially with respect to fair lending. Do you agree with that statement? I agree that we have continued to carry out our enforcement actions. We've had um, now 25, as of yesterday, public enforcement actions announced uh, during my tenure. And it remains, again, uh, my commitment that we will seek the appropriate remedies in each case. So that includes restitution for consumers, which in most cases is what we obtain. Uh, certainly not in all. Again, fact and circumstance based. Thank you very much. And I would try to advise you, see if you can answer the members' questions directly rather than uh, getting around uh, a commitment in your answers. With that, uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, the ranking member, Mr. McHenry. So I think what we're hearing this morning is a little bit of buyer's remorse about the structure. Your Senate confirmed, are you not? Yes. Presidentially, uh, the president uh, nominated you, the Senate confirmed you. Is yes. that correct? That is correct, sir. Uh, are there other folks at your agency that are Senate confirmed? No. And under the structure of this agency, you are the sole decision maker by which these decisions are made. Is that correct? Yes, it is. You can delegate this authority under statute to other people, but your responsibility is to be the final arbiter of these cases. <laughs> yes, it is. So if we don't like it, what can we do? We can go to the courts, can't we? But you don't have a public hearing, do you not? Are you required to have any public hearings about your, um, uh, your rulemaking? Uh, no, Congressman, I'm not. Okay, so what is my venue by which to comment about your rulemaking? Well, I will say it is important, and it's certainly important to me, as you well know, to engage in rulemaking appropriately using the Administrative Procedures Act, <clears throat> to actually have a notice and comment process, to carry that out, to take those comments into consideration, uh, as I make the best decision possible moving forward on any particular. Okay, so notice and comment, you can take that into consideration. If we don't like it, uh, there's not a public hearing, there's not a place for maybe members of Congress to show up and protest at your hearings like some of them did at the FDIC and OCC. There's not that venue. Okay, so what I'm hearing is there's buyer's remorse among Democrats because a Republican president appointed the director of the CFPB and they never foresaw that that could ever happen. So there's a little bit of buyer's remorse on this. 
I'm not asking you to opine on it because you're a Senate-confirmed presidential appointee. It is our role as members of Congress to make the policy, to make the law by which you are to follow. And the way I see it is uh, I appreciate that you're following the law. I also appreciate as a presidential appointee and being in an independent agency, you don't spend time commenting about your predecessor's actions. I can because it's my role, my proper role here in oversight, and they did an atrocious job with the management of that team they built. And so if you look at Cordray's regime, there was a movement to unionize because of such bad workplace practices, and we have public reports about those bad workplace practices. And on top of that, a toxic workforce, a, a toxic work environment that many have, uh, whistleblowers had called out. So what I appreciate is your undertaking to fix those problems to make this agency work. And that means uh, hiring practices, good procedures so you can have staff development uh, that is commensurate with an agency with your enormous power. So. Um, along the lines of accountability. You're the first director of the agency um, uh, was uh, appointed uh, via recess appointment. Is that not correct? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. And didn't the court in a nine to zero ruling strike down that as unconstitutional? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you said before your Senate confirmed that you believe the structure of this bureau was unconstitutional. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, Congressman. We did certainly submit our uh, request to the Supreme Court to actually hear the case. No, no, but before you're appointed, you said it was unconstitutional and the, the structure, and after you're appointed, you kept the same view. So, to be, to be clear, Congressman, beforehand, I did say that it was something that I knew would come before me, but that I had not prejudged it until I was in the position. Okay, and so based off the information you got, in this big public hearing, because you're required, to, I'm sorry, you don't, you're not required to hear anything, uh, but you decided uh, after reviewing uh, what? That it was, un, uh, that the agency's unconstitutional. Uh, really the, the position that the Bureau had taken in prior, legisl in prior uh, court proceedings, uh, the position that the government has taken in prior court proceedings, and certainly the opinions of, of judges in many prior proceedings. Okay. So based off of that, you, you in court filings are saying this bureau is unconstitutional. That the removal provision associated with the director of the agency uh, is unconstitutional and that okay. the Supreme Court uh, really is the one that should opine on that or Congress. So getting to that, if the Supreme Court rules there that, that that process is unconstitutional, I think it would, be, it would be good to hear from my Democrat friends that have been so focused on a single director to come up with a form of compromise so that this bureau can continue to function. Um, and if they're interested in legislating along those lines, we're all ears over here to come around to the things that we proposed when it was a uh, Democrat who had this seat and we've been consistent about uh, our policy with a Republican in this seat. So we look forward to this compromise because I believe the Supreme Court will demand it of us uh, before the summer's end. And with that, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your openness in the process and thank you for adhering to the rule of law. And thank you for opining about the things you should and staying away from the things you shouldn't that are perfectly in our political arena to hash out and fight about. So with that, thank you and I yield back. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Welcome, Director. Uh, Director Craninger, are you generally familiar with the Bureau's 2016 consent order with Wells Fargo over the fake accounts scandal? Yes, Congresswoman. So you know that the Bureau penalized Wells Fargo for conduct that it had determined was abusive under the law, and the Bureau also found that Wells Fargo's actions were both unfair and deceptive. The Bureau fined Wells Fargo $100 million for these violations, and that fine would have been substantially lower if the Bureau hadn't charged Wells Fargo with abusive uh, conduct also. But just two weeks ago, the Bureau released a policy statement on its abusiveness authority, which said that the Bureau would no longer penalize uh, conduct as abusive if it's already penalizing the same conduct as either unfair or deceptive. 
So under this new policy statement, would the Bureau have charged Wells Fargo with abusive conduct, or would Wells Fargo have gotten off even easier under your new policy? I appreciate the question, uh, Congresswoman, because it gets to the heart of this matter. What I am seeking to do with the policy statement is make sure that we clarify abusiveness and separate it from deceptive and unfairness because Congress explicitly gave us those three authorities to determine those kinds of acts and practices separately or provide claims to the courts that allow them to do that. And so we are looking at distinguishing the facts associated, but in no way should that policy be read to say that we would not bring abusiveness claims. The, the very intention, though, is to make sure that we are continuing to build on a clarity and an understanding uh, that abusiveness is, you know, is what it is. Uh, the, the ability to take unreasonable advantage of a consumer uh, it is something that we absolutely should go after. That's what Congress said. Okay. But having an unreasonable advantage over a consumer and taking a reasonable advantage of a consumer is something that clearly needs some distinction and, dis and distinguishment. And so uh, in terms of the Wells Fargo um, priors, I looked very carefully when we wrote this policy statement mm -hmm. and I signed it at the prior positions the Bureau has taken to make sure that we are you know, able to, again, distinguish those things. But the goal going okay. forward is okay. just to okay. say okay. that Reclaiming we are- Reclaiming my time. It understand. seems pretty obvious to me that Wells Fargo would have gotten off even easier under your new policy statement, and I find that deeply, deeply uh, disturbing. Uh, but I do want to get to overdraft. At one of our previous hearings, I asked if you would pledge to crack down on unfair abuse of deceptive overdraft policies, and I asked you to crack down on transaction reordering, which is where banks reorder their customers' transactions solely for the purpose of maximizing the number of overdraft fees they can charge. You agreed that this practice was unfair, and you said you would look into using every tool you had to combat this practice, including enforcement. So my question is, have you brought any enforcement actions for unfair overdraft practices since the last time you were here? Congresswoman, there are no public enforcement actions specifically on that, but I pledge to you that I absolutely hold my have word. You, have you brought, you okay, the answer is no. Have you brought any enforcement actions over unfair overdraft practices at all since you took over as director? Uh, no, no public actions, Congresswoman. So the answer is no. I find that very, very disappointing. You're the nation's top consumer financial regulator, and yet you refuse to take strong action on one of the most abusive practices facing consumers. When can we expect uh, action from you on overdraft fees? Congresswoman, I cannot manufacture cases. They're fact and circumstance specific. I absolutely am, and through the enforcement staff, carrying out the rigorous investigation of facts in cases that come to us through whistleblowers, through complaints, uh, through our own supervisory efforts, and we will continue to uh, monitor those things and carry through our responsibilities. I, I'm just a congresswoman, and I get uh, overdraft complaints all the time. You're the director of consumer protection for the entire country, and you're telling me that you have not received any complaints on overdraft practices that many people tell me trap them in never-ending debt. You, you, don't, you haven't gotten any complaint on it to act? No uh, one's complained about it in the country? To clarify that, yes, uh, you know we have the, the complaint database. We do take in complaints. Uh, so there have been complaints in that area of the market, but we take those complaints and we handle them accordingly. So getting a resolution for the individual consumer with their financial institution, and then taking that information to analyze it to decide whether there should be uh, actions on the supervisory front or the enforcement front. Uh, so that's, that's where we are. But you testified there's been no action. I yield back. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Director, thank you for attending today's hearing. You mentioned in your testimony that a critical component of preventing harm to consumers is to help them gather financial know-how and to empower consumers to choose products and services that best serve their needs. Could you elaborate on how the Small Start Save Up Initiative encourages people to hit savings goals 
And while you're doing that, could you update us on the work of the Research and Evaluation Working Group? Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman. It's an important area. Uh, bolstering savings is really the number one way that people can build their financial well-being, uh, can build up their ability to address setbacks that happen in life, and their ability to really think through and make the best decisions for themselves is having that savings cushion. So when I came to the Bureau, we launched Start Small, Save Up. We've been having extensive uh, meetings and outreach across the nation uh, with employers, uh, with communities, and bringing together all of the constituencies at communities, whether that's the consumer advocate groups, the legal aid community, uh, the um, faith community, business community, and talking about the things that are affecting them at their community level. And then also financial institutions and our fellow regulators who have a really good eye in what is what is the savings activity that's happening in the country? What are the barriers to savings for people? Um, so we're really looking holistically at this and trying to tackle it, again, to raise the savings levels in the nation. Um, also looking at a lot of the marketing and, and influencer uh, means of reaching people. Uh, the CFPB has produced fantastic financial education materials, but trying to make sure that we get those materials out um, is, is really one of the focuses, too, of this effort. And the research is, is part of that, too, understanding consumer behavior, uh, understanding what consumers uh, see in the marketplace and, and what motivates uh, those kinds of things. So we're, we're really looking at it from all facets. During your last visit, we discussed the fact that I represent 16 different Native American tribes in the 3rd District of Oklahoma, and we discussed the Bureau's tribal consultation policy. Could you touch on that for just a moment? Uh, absolutely, and I've since had the opportunity to, to visit Oklahoma, uh, did visit with tribal members while I was there, and have had extensive conversations about uh, where we go with this. The tribal consultation policy is around our uh, rulemaking efforts, so we do have a specific responsibility uh, to engage and ensure that entities that, are, uh, uh, that are, could be affected by our rulemaking have the opportunity to weigh in on them. So that's where that is uh, specifically uh, ongoing, uh, but we are looking at other ways to make sure that we are engaging with tribes uh, and understanding what their particular needs and, and issues are so we can help, help them and, and help them help their, cons their constituents and all consumers. In my few remaining moments, is there <laughs> anything that you'd like to address before my time expires? Uh, I, I think, Congressman, I understand the, the concerns and questions around abusiveness, but I will say that, that there is no uh, lack of ability to bring forward cases. I think recognizing the uncertainty that is here, there is also a responsibility to make sure that we're bringing the strongest cases forward uh, around defining abusiveness so that we don't get bad court rulings on this. I mean, that is another risk. It is, it is imperative when you bring an enforcement case forward that you have the assurance uh, of the facts and the basis for those cases. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, a, I'm happy to be trying to provide clarity, happy to be uh, moving forward in a way that's going to, again, add to uh, the case law on abusiveness and certainly thinking towards, I did, I did not rule out a rulemaking on this, um, but I think we need a little more time uh, to work through some of the issues around how the Bureau sees abusiveness, recognizing some of, the, some of the uncertainty. Thank you, Director. And certainly being a member of Congress, we understand the concept of wanting to win with intensity. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is recognized for five minutes. Th thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Director Croninger. I was pleased by the Bureau's decision to extend the QM patch, which will help millions of borrowers attain the dream of home ownership. According to media reports, the Bureau is also considering broader changes to the ability to repay qualified mortgage rule, which will be released in a notice of proposed rulemaking no later than May. How is the Bureau working to ensure borrowers from LMI communities, particularly African-American and Latinos, will not be disproportionately impacted by this proposal? Yeah. I, 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 Congresswoman, it's an important question and one that we struggled with as we looked at this. We knew that the, uh, the patch was intended to expire. There was some uh, expectation that the non-qualified mortgage space would actually expand and, and therefore, again, you'd deal with some of the very borrowers that uh, that you're concerned about through perhaps non-qualified mortgages in addition to qualified mortgages, uh, but that has not happened. 
Uh, so I think they, that's, that's really where this is. You know, how expansive should qualified mortgages be? How do we balance the issues that you're raising? Well, and, the most really looking carefully at that. The most important question for me is how will considerations of this community be reflected in the proposed rule? Yeah. I can tell you we've, uh, I personally uh, and bureau staff have met extensively with consumer advocate groups and other community groups on this topic, on other topics, and well, we're taking all of those things into account as we well, move forward. Well, we, we, we are watching, and uh, any proposal that negatively uh, impact black and Latinos um, to purchase a home will be unacceptable. So, Director, last time that you were here, I expressed you, my concern, and the concerns I was hearing from consumer lending and fair housing groups about the CFPB's decision to retire the Honda Explorer tool. Since that time, what steps have you taken to address the concern of these groups, and what remedies have you considered? Uh, there are myriad conversations that have been happening since that time. The Humda Explorer tool remains available, uh, but as you might recall, it is not something that can be used because it's just not supported anymore. We don't even have staff who can support that technology because it's older uh, and was stood up pretty quickly to meet some of the needs. So we have a new tool that is working with the new data, and we're talking to uh, the advocacy community and others to make sure that we get the right features into that tool that, that are needed for them to do the analysis so, they'd like to do. After you issued your new tool, what, what do you hear from um, the groups? I, there, it's been well received because we've continued to build on the capabilities yeah, that are available me. there in the report. Excuse me. Um, I have a letter here that was sent to you by 80 groups, NCR, NCRC, mm -hmm. and, it, uh, and I'm going to quote, our members and allies are concerned that the CFPB is implementing public dissemination of HOMBA, HOMBA data in a manner that thwarts its, its statutory purpose. So what, do you, what is your response to that? I can tell you, Congresswoman, I, I'm familiar with the letter. I responded to it uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about more data than has ever been available before. And so so what, what do you say to, in, in your letter to them? Uh, noting the, the substantial changes that were made in the rulemaking and the data collection is, is really what this is about. And it's it, hard for you know, basic uh, users of a system to understand all the analytical capabilities. What? We're going to do some webinars uh, to help them understand how to use the new tool. We're going to talk to uh, folks again about what kinds of things in terms of reports they want to see. But I can tell you they have yes. better reports than they've ever had before in, available in to your, them. In your, in your response, you uh, agreed that the data browser posed some challenges for users but that you were looking to bridge the information gaps that users face and develop additional resources for them to use the data. This is the letter that you sent to them yes. on Tuesday. So how exactly are you working to bridge this information gap and what additional resources are you considering? So we have a really talented team of people working on this and talking yeah, 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 to consumer groups. We're, doing, we're gonna do some <laughs> webinars. Direct, or I know that and it, so, I know that as director of the CFPB, you are also a member of the FDIC Board of Directors, correct? Yes. So do you vote in favor of the FDIC signing onto the OCC's recent uh, CRA proposal? I did. Well, by eliminating the Honda Explorer tool and making it more difficult for public dissemination of Honda data, how are you expecting fair housing groups and even us, elected officials, to have access to that information. Is that it, how you empower consumers? That's why you said to Carolyn Maloney that you were holding a lot of meetings. The gentlelady's time is expired. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Director Craninger. Uh, the chairman keeps talking about it. a number of other members continue to throw out the figures of uh, the amount of money that's recovered by your, by your the initial uh, director, Cordray. And I have been here through this entire time. And I can tell you that the money, a lot of it, was not necessarily as a result of finding bad actors. It was about 
issuing guidance and enforcing that and extorting the money from those, those entities. Uh, the previous director played very fast and loose with the law. He played very fast and loose with the rules and created guidance with which he could enforce and then beat over the head the various entities. <coughs> I've had numerous meetings with those individuals, group, individual groups, and that is the case. So it, it's very disconcerting to me to continue to hear these numbers being thrown out whenever it's very disingenuous and misreporting what actually went on. Um, I'm very thankful that you're trying to do something with abusiveness. I've always argued that this is a very nebulous term. I don't think there's even a definition in law uh, anywhere that actually, actually tells you what abusiveness is. It's whatever you deem it to be. And for you to come in and give us a, an explanation of what you believe it to be and how you're going to enforce it, I think it's very instructive, and I thank you for that. Um, to me, this is a, a great way to begin to, to rein in some of the egre egregious behavior that was there in, in one of your predecessors' uh, administration. So with that, let me begin uh, with regards to the small dollar rule. Uh, last year, I, I, along with 24 of my colleagues, sent you a letter regarding the, uh, the payments provision of the small dollar rule. Can you give me an update on where this rule stands, and are you making changes to the payments provision? Congressman, uh, the rulemaking, uh, the NPRM closed, comment period closed last year. We are working our way through uh, an extensive number of comments, frankly, on that rule, which is understandable. Uh, we have aimed for a um, determination on a final rule that would be issued in April. Uh, so that is where that stands. There was a petition on the payment provisions that is still pending, and I expect to be able to provide clarity on that petition in response to it at the same time. Uh, so that's the timeline uh, for, for that small dollar rulemaking effort. Okay, thank you. Um, with regards to uh, TRID, I want to thank you for your action reviewing the TLRESPA integrated TRID rule. I think it's important to ensure that this rule is achieving its goal of combining certain mortgage disclosures. Uh, I think the amount of paperwork in a mortgage is a major issue that this committee needs to address. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the stack of papers it takes uh, to, to make a loan today from state mandated forms, federally mandated forms, and lender mandated forms, I think we need to get everyone together and really simplify the process and think about redoing it. I mean, we had an individual representing one of the entities in here not too long ago, and he had a stack of papers literally this tall. And so all the folks behind me were kind of giggling about it and saying, I wonder how many pages are there? So I asked him, and he said, Congressman, we no longer measure by the page, we measure by the pound. This has got to stop. Nobody reads it. You get, you get writer's cramp initialing all the pages. They're superfluous. They don't mean anything. We've got to get together and find a way to do this. Um, I guess to my point, uh, are you examining the rules to try and find ways that you can consolidate this? And if so, how are you doing? Uh, can you point to some of them that you're refining or getting rid of or whatever? Yes. Uh, two things. One, you mentioned the assessment. So we are in the midst of the five-year assessment of TRID uh, since it's been issued. And so we're getting comments back from a lot of entities around the cost of compliance and the utility of, of some of the requirements there, matching that against uh, what is in the statute and, and making sure that we are you know, meeting the statute, but there's got to be a better way to do this. I completely agree with you and the many who have noted this to me. So I would, I would offer the trial disclosure policy, which is one of the innovation policies that we issued in September. We're having a lot of conversations with different entities around that, uh, inclu including consumer advocates. I mean, we all want better understanding by consumers of what uh, <coughs> financial uh, terms and agreements they are making, their ability to understand that, uh, the ability to provide, frankly, the information at the right time. You know, closing is not the best time for all of these types of disclosures, so looking at the timing elements of TRID, what is statutorily required and what is not, uh, and see if we can do this in a much more simplified way. So the disclosure policy um, process through our innovation policies is where I hope to be able to test some different ways to get simplified and better disclosure. Are you looking at technology perhaps to be able to improve some of the things, uh, either put stuff off online or make it available or, or streamline it that way? Is that a possibility? Yes, there are a number of companies that are looking at, at electronic disclosures, again, for those consumers that want them. We know younger consumers absolutely want it electronically, and so giving them that option and figuring out, again, how we can match that with the timing element will be really useful. To me, it, I think the, you know, the criteria needs to be, is this necessary? What, what are we trying to accomplish with this form? Are you protecting the consumer or are you protecting the lender? And, and is, there, is there a reason for this? And I think uh, hopefully we can find a way to get through that. But thank you very much, and I yield back. 
The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is also chair for the Subcommittee on uh, Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is now recognized for five minutes. As often, often when you come here, I remind you of uh, Dodd-Frank Section 1022, which allows you to scale regulations, particularly when you're dealing with smaller uh, institutions. Uh, many have talked about the importance of having a clear QM rule and QM patch, and uh, I think you un understand that. I hope that you act well in advance of any deadline. But I notice from your testimony that you're moving in a particular direction that I'm not sure is supported by the law. You say you're moving away from a, a debt to income threshold, which looks at whether the borrower can afford the loan to a uh, pricing mechanism where you focus on is the loan at a fair price. So this would lead you to the conclusion that a billionaire does not have the ability to repay a million dollar mortgage if it's a 7% mortgage. And that someone working at, mi at minimum wage does have the ability to repay a million dollar mortgage if it's offered at 4%. Does the statute allow you to ignore whether this borrower can repay and substitute what could have been the rule and, and what in many areas perhaps should be the rule, and that is, is, is the interest rate a good interest rate? Congressman, the, first and foremost, the, the statutory provisions obviously carry forward and remain. So consideration of debt to income ratio is actually, it's in the statute, it's mm -hmm. a requirement uh, in terms of the way that that's articulated. The challenge has been with the threshold of 43%, and some of this gets to, um, again, whether a loan will actually end up performing well, and what is, what is the best way, you know, what is the best yeah. measure of that? If I, if I can reclaim my time and make Please. a couple of comments. You're kind of saying, it must be something the borrower can't afford to repay or the bank wouldn't make the loan at a good interest rate. That the only way you can stay in business making loans to people who can't afford to repay is if you charge so much an in interest rate that you make it up, uh, uh, you make up for a high level of, of defaults. I'd also point out that there's a regional variation that certainly affects our city of Los Angeles. People in LA make $7,000 a year more and we spend it all on housing. That's the, that's the LA family. And so with that lifestyle, a one where you spend less on, um, uh, on heating and, and some other costs, and you spend more on your house, you may want to look at regional variations. Um, I want to look at pay, uh, PACE loans. In uh, March, you issued a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, but you don't seem to have taken uh, any uh, steps since then. Uh, the law signed in May 2018 whose title exceeds the amount of time I have to repeat it, um, uh, requires you to have regulations uh, setting out requirements, uh, implementing at least the purposes of uh, TILA uh, and ability to pay requirements. Where, uh, what, what's the stall on, on PACE loans? It's been about 10 months. The latest, uh, Congressman, is actually a data collection that we are engaged in now uh, to get better information from PACE lenders uh, about the marketplace. So that's where we are right now, and we're gonna use that, that data collection to form the basis of the rulemaking. And we are moving as expeditiously as we can. I know, I know it's uh, not satisfactory, but, but defining the unique nature of PACE, which is what Congress well, asked it's, us to It's very similar to any other trust deed you get on your house. I mean, can you, if, if you encumber your home to build a new bedroom, maybe you can afford that. Maybe you can't uh, say it's, it's, it's the same answer whether it's a new air conditioning system uh, or a new bedroom. Um, it's, uh, uh, do you have an estimated time of arrival on this? I don't at this particular moment, Congressman, but we'll get back to you. The next step is, is really the notice of proposed rulemaking after this data collection, though. Um, it's been several months since the comment period closed uh, regarding the January 21, uh, 2021 expiration of the QM patch. What other information can you give us about your uh, plans regarding uh, the pending sunset uh, 
uh, and uh, what assurance can you give the mortgage markets? Yes. Um, I sent the letter back to uh, Senator uh, Warner and others on this and made that available uh, more broadly because I wanted to make sure we were sending signals to the marketplace about this very important market in mortgages. I know the time is running out. I'll here. ask you to pick up the pace on pace. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you, Director Craninger, for being here. Uh, we're about an hour into this hearing, uh, and I think my colleague uh, from North Carolina's comments at the beginning uh, that there might be buyer's remorse on the structure of the CFPB uh, just continues to get reiterated in this room. As I look at the, the battling PowerPoints going back and forth, it seems like there's a desire on both sides to have more transparency and accountability in the CFPB. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity for us at some point uh, to come together and actually put the CFPB under an appropriations process and to set up a commission structure. That's not uh, for you, that's more uh, editorial for the committee at whole, that there's a real opportunity for us to improve the structure that was set up for the CFPB. Let's dive in. Uh, the UDAP rule in particular, uh, Director Craninger, your predecessor uh, declined to clarify what the CFPB considers to be an abusive act or practice in the context of the Bureau's uh, UDAP authority. Uh, and previously, the CFPB exploited this ambiguity to stretch its enforcement authority. Among other things, it caused a lot of confusion for covered firms to the detriment of American consumers. With that in mind, uh, I want to commend you for issuing a policy statement last month clarifying how the Bureau intends to exercise its supervisory and enforcement authority with respect to abusive acts and practices. And I, if I can, I'd like you just to clarify something a step further that was, that was footnoted in the remark that I think has an opportunity for further clarification. Um, the Bureau, I think, very clearly intends to apply this policy statement on a going forward basis. Uh, but it left some ambiguity as to the discretion that the Bureau would be using uh, as it regards to those that are currently pending in court. Can you comment on how the CFPB uh, will review prior cases in which an abusive claim has previously been made uh, and how cases will be prioritized? Uh, certainly looking at the history of abusive claims was part of the process of, of coming up with this policy. And uh, at this point, you know, we, we have not amended any filings in court and, and don't intend to related to this specifically. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for, for putting forward a statement as to how you guys are going to be analyzing this. I think there's a real ripe for abuse uh, previously. Let me, let me ask you a, a question that I think you've been asked before and you've stated before, but I think it's just important to get it on the record. Um, in particular, can you say that the CFPB does not have the legal authority to regulate the business of insurance? Uh, yes, that is, that is explicitly excluded from our jurisdiction in the Dodd-Frank Act. I, I appreciate it. I just think it's important to continue to reiterate that uh, because, as noted, we don't have the full transparency and authority in the event that you are no longer director and we end up with another director in the future. Can first thank you for working uh, with the Department of Education on a new memorandum of understanding regarding how student borrower complaints uh, information will be handled. Uh, do you anticipate the CFPB and the Department of Education negotiating additional agreements to clarify jurisdictional issues on supervisory services, for instance? Yes, our conversation on that is ongoing, uh, and I think is an important note in terms of where we're going with this. The Department of Edu Education is, is changing through their next-gen process, the way that they deal with contractors who are doing servicing of federal loans. Uh, we want to work with them on that and support them, which is what we have tried to do all along in terms of um, carrying out the uh, supervision, I guess, oversight through our examination process, making sure that we're consistent with their policies. Uh, and so that's what we're going to uh, work with them on. They're looking to develop a more rigorous oversight of their contractors. We're looking to do that jointly with them so that we can carry out our responsibility for overseeing federal consumer financial law, and they can carry out uh, their extensive responsibilities over how program execution works and the Higher Education Act and their other authorities. Uh, so I think there's a, a good path forward uh, for us to, to provide that certainty for students. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your work in this area, and I yield back.
The gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Madam Director, let me just go back briefly um, to a question that I think Chairwoman Waters asked. I know what the intent of Congress was. Congress, Congress intended to create, the reason they created the CFPB was to have someone to speak and to protect consumers. You're absolutely right. But her question to you was, do you believe, not what Congress believes, but do you believe in the mission of the CFPB? I believe the federal government has a responsibility to protect consumers in the marketplace consistent with the authorities that Congress has given us. So you've taken a job because since you can't say that you believe in the mission, you know, because most folks when they take these jobs, whether you're working for the president or whatever, you do, you do that because you believe in what that mission is. You want to make sure that you are fighting for a specific outcome. And if you can't state here that you believe in the mission of the CFPB, then it seems to me, Madam Director, you have taken a job that you are not committed to. Congressman, let me just clarify. I absolutely believe in the mission of the CFPB. I've been tasked with carrying it out. That is what I am definitely doing. So now, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it was not named the Financial uh, Services Protection Bureau. It was not named the Business Protection Bureau. It was not named uh, anything else. It was named specifically the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because there was no other agency that had the sole mission of protecting consumers. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, so therefore, if you are the head of the Consumers Financial Protection Bureau, then your job would, or part of your job would be to advocate and to protect the rights of the consumers that may complain before your bureau that they have been taken advantage of by uh, uh, a product that might not have been the appropriate product. That's the reason why we had the financial crisis of 2008, because a lot of individuals were put into products that they should not have been put into. Is that correct? Do you understand that? I do, sir, yes. Okay. So, now it seems to me that what we have going on now, let's take the industry, let's take the industry of payday lending. It has been broad that a number of consumers across this country have been victimized and put into debt forever because of some of the payday lenders' bad practices. Would you admit to that? I would tell you, sir, that we have taken enforcement actions against uh, small dollar lenders that are public and, and well discussed. But if you area. are an advocate for consumers, if you are focused on them, why then would the number of cases that you bring have substantially declined over the last couple of years, as well as the fact that you have decided not to continue some of the uh, uh, regulations that have been put forward in regards to protecting consumers, like the first principle, making sure that someone has the ability to pay back, and that you cannot as Mr. Cadre had, you can cap the number at three of loans that lenders could use in quick succession. This would be something to protect consumers so that they won't go down that path. And it seems to me that you have decided to suspend moving in that direction those items that will protect a consumer, which is the very reason that this agency was created in the first place, and the number has gone down. And there seems not to be any 
advocacy because what I'm hearing you saying that, well, I'm looking at, how it sounds to me, more interested in protecting the financial institutions as opposed to protecting and advocating for the very reason why you have a job, to protect consumers. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Director. Thank you for taking the time to be able to be here today. I uh, uh, was pleased to hear you say uh, that uh, you want to be able to stand up for the mission of the CFPB. Uh, just had a lot of commentary. I think part of it is we need to be able to make sure that all people have access to capital as well to be able to meet their needs. And uh, you had a fair conversation, uh, one-sided coming at you. Would you like to maybe make a couple of responses back to my colleague? Uh, yes, thank you, sir, for that opportunity. Uh, the mission of the CFPB is, is critical. Um, we are carrying that out using the tools that you all gave us, education, regulation, supervision, and enforcement. Enforcement is not the only tool. Uh, we are not standing with consumers when they make every decision, so we need to empower them with the best information possible. That's why that education uh, tool is incredibly important. Uh, regulation, again, and supervision are around setting up clarity in the rules so that entities that are engaged in financial services understand their responsibilities and are providing consumers with the information that they need. And then absolutely, rigorous enforcement is, is part of the mission. We continue to carry it out. Uh, I will not manufacture cases. So we are absolutely doing our due diligence and in investigations, but ongoing cases uh, are, are being worked. So I can assure you of that. There are clearly bad actors in the system, and we will go after them. Uh, but we clearly have a difference of opinion regarding how the mission should be carried out. Thank you for that. And uh, did also want to, there's been a fair amount of scrutiny on CFPB in terms of some of the hiring. A uh, little bit of irony. Uh, there was no concern when Director Cordray was making his hires. Uh, do you have the, the authority as the director of the CFPB to be able to hire the people to be able to fulfill the mission uh, that you've been granted? I do. The authorities given to the CFPB are the same in Title V that were given to uh, every other agency in the federal government. And I am utilizing the hiring authorities that I've been given. Uh, also worth noting and appropriate to the stand-up of the agency, uh, the first three years of the agency, they had a transition authority to hire outside of civil service protections. Uh, so again, that was, that was never criticized to my knowledge uh, and was appropriate to support the stand-up. But it is not as if every employee at the Bureau was selected under civil service uh, processes. Great. Uh, you know, I think it's notable, admirable uh, right now that uh, CFPB is priding itself on being a modern, data-driven government agency. Uh, I think that this is clear uh, that this needs to be an integral part of being able to move forward. And, how does the plan, uh, what is the proposal that you're seeing under the CFPB to be able to actually promote uh, something that I, I've always felt is critical for government at all levels uh, in terms of decision making when it comes to cost benefit analysis? So I, I do think it's critically important to, uh, we, we have econ econ economists uh, in our agency. I've looked at, at the number of them. I'd frankly like to bring in a few more to help us with, with cost benefit analysis and more rigor. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean quantified. Uh, there is a qualitative aspect to this as well, but there's a rigor to the an analytic process of actually determining what the impacts are. Uh, very much, Congressman, you mentioned access uh, to credit, and that is something that I think we need to better incorporate and understand as we're looking at regulatory actions, what impact that will have on the availability uh, and access to responsible credit for consumers, you know, the impact of any rulemaking on that. I just wanted to be able to get your thoughts. We've had a number of conversations over an extended period of time in this committee. Structurally, what should the CFPB look like? A uh, number of us had advocated, uh, with all respect to you, all respect to Mr. Cordray who preceded you, uh, you shouldn't be in full control as an individual. Uh, but to be able to have a five-member panel uh, was one of the proposals. Do you think that that would be a better structural uh, form for the CFPB? I appreciate why you're asking the question, and I have uh, pointedly not taken a position on this. This is absolutely something that is in Congress's purview to determine. 
And should Congress enact anything, the, the President sign it, become law, uh, we will carry out to the best of our abilities what other um, measures Congress wants to put in place or changes. Right. Just uh, finally, I'd like you to be, give you the opportunity to be able to respond to some of our friends on the other side of the aisle in regards to uh, settling uh, pending lawsuits brought by the previous Bureau, uh, and you've not pursuing new actions. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, what, what are your policies? What, how are you moving forward? So again, Congress gave us broad authority to look at injunctive relief, restitution, to take the right action in any particular case, and that's what we're seeking to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yield back. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady, and welcome, Director Carringer. As um, you and I have discussed, and uh, we've enjoyed several discussions, you know on my deep concern about financial education. It is a crisis uh, and very much needed. And um, I have put forward two pieces of legislation, one which in targeting, and because as I said to you, it is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that should be at the front of the spear on financial education, because that is the first line of defense for consumer financial protection is consumer financial education. And I'm so delighted to know of the excellent program that is being developed um, at the Wharton School of Finance. Um, Maya Mamata served on the executive board of directors there for a while, and I'm very proud of the pilot program that they have going with the financial business sector in Philadelphia. And you and I have talked about that. So we have the second bill that we're working on because we've got to get grants and help into these public-private sector partnerships. That is the key to be able to develop the best instructional, the best kinds of curriculums to teach in our public schools, we got to start there. Our financial system is moving at a rapid pace. Technology is overwhelming us in that respect. I'm also working very closely with Mr. Lynch, Ms. Waters, French Hill, and others on making sure that we address this issue. So I wanted to uh, make you, uh, give you an opportunity to express uh, how you are working with this. Um, our bill is being put together as we speak, but we have got to do that. As I pointed out, and I hope people across this nation are listening to me, because we only have 17 states' public school systems that even offer one course in financial education, financial literacy. And we can sit up here till the cows come home trying to write laws and legislation, you pass them, to target these predatory lenders. But if we do not put forward the kinds of innovative programs, like what the Wharton School is developing in Philadelphia, with their financial business community to get this into our schools for, for, so we can have the courses developed, to get them into our libraries. Then we're putting our money where our mouth is. We have 28 million unbanked, underbanked families in this country. Not mama, not daddy, sister, brother, nobody even have a bank account. Technology is moving at warp speed. We're going through a financial services revolution, and we've got to get money and resources to those public-private ventures who are out there in the first place. 
to help make this happen. So we, you will be the executor of this grant-making authority. And uh, in my last 45 seconds, I'd love for you to comment on this and how much you're looking forward to getting this bill passed and getting resources out there in the public and private sector and teach our young people financial education. Congressman, I truly appreciate and share your passion for financial education. Uh, we've had great conversations about that. Uh, should this bill become law, we will carry it out. But I can tell you, regardless, uh, the CFPB is committed to supporting those kinds of public-private partnerships, uh, taking any actions we can, because as you pointed out, we, we can't be with consumers when they make these decisions. On and you will help us basis. get this law passed, correct? The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollinsworth, is recognized for five minutes. Well, good morning. First and foremost, I wanted to associate myself with the great comments of Rep. Scott. He and I have worked closely on this issue, and his passion for it is palpable in everything that he does. And I truly believe that an informed, educated consumer is a consumer that's better able to protect themselves, right? These nefarious actors that frequently operate in the space, they are more creative than we are. Um, and it seems that they can come up with more schemes than we can easily make illegal. And so ensuring that customers are their first and foremost advocate is really, really important to me as well. So I appreciate his work on that. I wanted to talk to you about Humda. Uh, I know in 2015, though the law was originally passed in 1975, the CFPB had expanded the number of data fields that were collected and even expanded the scope of this to include multifamily properties. At the time, I believe they argued it should have always been included or it was always intended to be included, um, but certainly it was a surprise to many um, that they were included and some commercial to commercial transactions were also included. I know in May of last year, an ANPR seeking comments on whether to exempt multifamily and other business to business loans from Humda was put forth, I think that closed in October of 2019, um, but I wanted to get a better update about that process and whether, as of right now, the current thinking is that we should exempt multifamily properties or commercial to commercial loans from HUMDA requirements. So as you indicated, we actually extended the comment period on that ANPR on purpose so right. that the uh, respondents could have the benefit of the data that came in Perfect. as a result of that rule. So we are still going through the comments. Great. I believe that our unified agenda said that we would um, entertain a, potentially a notice of proposed yeah. rulemaking if we decide to proceed uh, in July yeah. on this. Uh, and so there's no uh, posture I can tell you, but I can very much tell you we did get comments on the topic you're interested in, and we're pouring through that to see uh, what path to take on the proposed rule should we move forward? Well, I would only share with you that I've had a great number of meetings about people that are very concerned about this and want to see uh, some relief provided or exemptions provided for multifamily um, and commercial to commercial loans and a recognition that um, though perhaps it was argued in 2015 that it should have been included, was included, was always intended to be included, that that certainly didn't seem to be the case for the first 30 years or 40 years of the legislation itself. Um, so I appreciate that. Wanted to jump really big topics um, for a second, though, and talk about banks offering small dollar short-term lending products. This is something that I've worked on since the day I walked into Congress because frankly, many Hoosiers back home in very rural communities uh, rely on these products um, and or at one time relied on these products. And frankly, the banks that were offering them were offering them in good faith and creating better outcomes for these consumers. And in the absence of those products, they turn to more um, perhaps predatory, right? Uh, perhaps in sundry characters for such loans, right? And ultimately, I want to ensure that they have access to these products going forward. It's something that I hear about from them on a week-to-week -week basis back home. Um, and that, that feeling that they operate in a different economy, that they don't have access to the same products that urban and suburban consumers do is real. Um, and I wondered if you might talk about any notable points or any action that is coming on these small dollar short-term lending products. Uh, certainly one of the things that I've talked about in this space is right. the need for competition. Yes. Uh, that absolutely will help. Consumers do have a, a desire for, there is a significant demand, and I would say a need for, right. small dollar lending products, and certainly ones that are responsible. Uh, credit unions did get a, a carve out uh, mm -hmm. in the prior rulemaking even, uh, but banks did not. So yeah. there are some real dynamics with respect to how we can um, 
promote the kinds of competition that's going to be good for consumers in this space and give them better products to, to choose from. I love that. Um, in a lot of the data that I've seen, consumers were, A, very aware of the prices that they were paying for those products. It wasn't as if um, that was being hidden from them and there was a lack of transparency. Two, or B, they were really happy with those products, right? By and large, they were return users of the products or alternatively had rated very highly. Um, and then C, importantly, they were there were appropriate off-ramps to ensure that they weren't frequently using them and getting dependent on them, right? I mean, they were reporting to credit bureaus as well. Do you have a timeline when you might make a final rule public with regard to that and some of your thoughts uh, public? The, the final rule uh, consideration we have said in the unified agenda, uh, April would be right. when we are gonna put that out. Uh, we're gonna deal with the petition also on the payments provisions, which again, I know Financial institutions have argued that there were some products pulled into that uh, that were, uh, you know, un, un unintended. Intended. And yeah, so yeah. just working through all of that and, and certainly moving forward in a way that is transparent in, in April is what I'm planning to do. Well, I really appreciate your efforts and work in that space because it is really important to Hoosiers back home. Thank you so much, and I'll yield the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who's also the chair for the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the director for appearing. Uh, Madam Director, I too am concerned about data collection. And my concern has to do with why we collect the data. Would you give me your rationale for why Humda data and the equivalent data collected, uh, hopefully, by the uh, CFPB is important? Yes, Congressman. Uh, the Home Mortgage Data Act uh, really was a disclosure act, and, and on purpose, I should say disclosure act. It's, it's about disclosing home mortgage data uh, so that that is available publicly, so that there's the opportunity for everyone uh, to see the kinds of activity happening in that space. So that that was clearly part of the congressional intent um, and as a fair lending I do statute concur. as well. I do concur, but why is the data important, please? Why is it important to know the race, the sex, the ethnicity? Why are these things important? Uh, certainly the intent is to um, demonstrate that that type of lending is happening, to note if there are uh, any disparities in that, and, and that, that is the intent. Do you believe that invidious discrimination exists in lending? Uh, yes, I believe it does, and I believe it exists generally in society, and uh, it's a, an abhorrent thing and something that we should work to root out. And because you believe that it exists, are you going to uh, push uh, the CFPB as the director to make sure that we have the level of transparency necessary to ascertain whether the discrimination of which we speak exists? Yes, Congressman. That is certainly the uh, intent of Humda and the intent of other uh, actions. Uh, I'm looking at some things that we can do that will help uh, in our fair lending enforcement um, cases as well uh, to really make sure that we are taking action where we, where we see these types of issues. Thank you, that's a great segue into the question that I'd like to ask. Uh, testing has proven to be a, a most effective means by which we can determine uh, the existence or non-existence of discrimination. Give me your views on using testing as a tool, please. Uh, Congressman, I think you might have even asked me about this before. I have. We, have used, we have used testing in this case and, and I, uh, leave it to the enforcement staff to determine when or where or why uh, they decide to use that as a means to uh, suss out what might be happening at particular institutions. Uh, but it is something that, that is, um, again, a, a tool that we have available to us that we use. I, I don't see in your report an indication uh, of the extent to which you are using testing. Uh, I don't see an indication as to uh, the efficacy of your efforts. Can you give me some indication as to how effective testing has been and the extent to which you're utilizing it? Uh, Congressman, I, I don't want to necessarily show our hand in a public setting around how much we use it or, or how, you know, otherwise that's, that is uh, investigative information that's sensitive. Well, I'm happy to talk to you about that further, though. I'll, and, I'll be honored and, and to talk to you, you about it further, but, and I don't mean to be uh, rude, but 
I have little time. You see, the deterrent impact is lost when we talk about it privately. We need to talk about the fact that there are people who are being tested and that people are being caught engaging in invidious discrimination. So a private meeting does not help us with the deterrent impact of the testing itself. So again, I would ask, give me some indication as to the extent that we're doing it and uh, the impact that we're having. I can tell you that the Department of Justice and the CFPB both have that ability and authority and that we use it. Would you, would you in your next report, give some more definition to the impact that testing is having and the extent that you're utilizing it, please? I promise you, sir, I'll take that back and we'll talk about what additional information we can provide that, that gets at what you're looking for. I, I would appreciate it greatly because, again, it's the deterrent impact knowing that there are testers out there, knowing that you must uh, abide by the rules and regulations or you may find yourself in litigation. That's the impact that we're looking for, aside from catching people. I'd like to deter people. I'd like to prevent invidious discrimination. So this would be very helpful. And I thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Director Craninger. Thank you for all the work you're doing at the CFPB. We appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us. I also want to thank you for the timeline on the small dollar rule. What we've been asking about that, and I know it's been very challenging to, to get a final date. April sounds good. Could you talk about the process? How long was uh, the public comment open? How many comments did you receive? What uh, use was that, uh, just briefly? Um, certainly. Uh, so the notice of proposed rulemaking, I believe, was issued last April. I'll admit I've, the date is escaping me precisely at the moment, uh, but it was a 90-day comment period. Uh, we did receive 190,000 plus comments. Uh, many are, you know, repeat comments that are that are organized by by all sides uh, on the issue and, and multiple people submitting it. Uh, so that's something to to pour through. Uh, we provide all of that on the public docket as well. So that did take a little time again to get some of those comments on the public docket. So those are available fully for everyone to review uh, while we're reviewing them and determining uh, which uh, which comments, uh, what responses, I suppose I should say, uh, go to which comments. And anything that we rely on in rulemaking process, we must address and, and will address uh, in this process. So it, it is uh, it is timely to, to time taking, I should say, to, to move through all of that. Uh, but we're moving uh, smartly uh, to to come to resolution on this issue. It was also productive, I imagine. There were some things that you uh, may not have included in your initial analysis, and it was uh, a good and uh, it was a productive process. Absolutely, yes. I certainly believe uh, fully in, in that transparency that notice and comment provides and the opportunity to go back and forth um, with the public and, and see the dialogue on that. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to move to the 2017 uh, final rule on payday lending and how it would impose unnecessary regulation on bank loans that do not raise consumer protection concerns. For example, bridge loans, revolving lines of credit, and loans secured by securities held in a brokerage account, they'd all be subject to the same requirements as a two-week loan for $500. Um, is there any justification for using a rule targeting payday loans to regulate uh, traditional loan products offered by banks? Uh, I can tell you, sir, that we did get a petition to assess uh, some aspects of what you're outlining. I have certainly heard from financial institutions and others about products that may have inadvertently been pulled into uh, the small dollar rule. And so responding to that petition, uh, as I mentioned to others, is something that we're going to do at the same time in April so that we can provide some clarity around some of these questions and a, and a path forward there. Great. Thank you. Uh, one last question. What steps have you taken to create better relationships between the Bureau and industry participants, its supervisors, and regulators? I believe it's critically important. Again, we, we need financial institutions to understand what their responsibilities are, to provide consumers with the information that they need to make uh, good decisions in compliance with the law. And so that outreach and ongoing engagement is, is important. I can also tell you that, that I have done something a little bit differently here uh, than what has happened in the past at the Bureau, is bringing multiple stakeholders together so that we can solve a problem. 
Uh, it's not just about meeting with the financial institutions alone. It's having the advocates in the room as well so that they can provide their perspective and the problems they're seeing and we can get to resolution and, and have a true conversation about the policy issues uh, associated, the access issues, the problems that real individuals are having and come to resolution. And so I, I am ex excited about all opportunities to keep doing things like that, uh, to have the kinds of public hearings that the ranking member mentioned as we did on debt collection. So we're really pulling together um, different parts of the country, frankly, even to talk about these things and, and solve problems. That's great. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Caston, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nice to see you again, Director Craninger. Uh, it's been a little over two years since Secretary DeVos terminated two MOUs with the CFPB to protect student loan borrowers. One facilitated sharing complaint information and one facilitated sharing supervisory information. I want to make sure I understand the MOU that you announced, uh, I think, February 3rd this week. You've reestablished the MOU that allows your complaint information sharing. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so in, in a letter dated April 23rd, 2019 to Senator Warren on this topic, you said, and I quote, and again, this is almost a year ago, the department continues to have access to the Bureau's public complaint database and Bureau staff continue to analyze complaint data and can provide that analysis as technical assistance if requested by the department. Does the Department of Education have more than one complaint database? Uh, I am not 100% sure on that, sir, but I, think, I, I don't think they have more than one uh, database, but I'm not sure what their structure is, but we are absolutely continuing to share um, I'm, the information. I'm, I'm simply asking, in April 23rd, you said that you already had something in place that does what the uh -huh. MOU you just issued says you have, so. I understand what you're saying. Uh, it is fair to say that we uh, continued to work together to address complaints even <clears throat> without the MOU in place, that is true. But what the MOU does is provide the certainty and clarity uh, on how this is going to work, uh, the roles and responsibilities so that we can move out in, in a way that's more formalized and, and agreed to. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna take that that the current MOU does not in any way change your, your oversight authority. I wanna to turn to the second MOU that allows for supervisory information sharing. In this same letter, April 23rd of last year, uh, you said, it is a priority for the Bureau to make progress on a new MOU. I want to have the private education loan obsbudsman in place to have that conversation. Have you now put that individual in place? Uh, yes, Bob Cameron's been on board since about September, okay. and that's one of the first thing he did was the complaints MOU, and then we have a head of supervision enforcement and fair lending, and one of the first things he did was move out with who, the Department of was, Education on supervision. Who was responsible for working on the supervisory MOU? Uh, Brian Schneider is. How long has Brian Schneider been with the CFPB? I think since October, November. Of which year? November of last year. Okay, so he was there before. And what progress has been made on, re on renewing that MOU? Uh, we are still in discussions on the MOU, but I can offer at least one thing that is very, uh, I think, positive. We are going to send detailees uh, to the Department of Education to work together on how we can jointly go in and conduct oversight. We're going to do exams for uh, our authorities under federal consumer okay. financial law, and they're going to be doing their contract oversight. And so we're looking at how we set up so the I, process I, to make that so happen. Just, I think that's terrific. You appreciate my concern that a year ago we said we're going to work on the supervisory issues. A year ago we said we're going to work on the, the data issues. And we have one MOU that essentially reinforces what was already done, and the other one hasn't made any progress. I'd like to do that now, not in the future. I want to turn to student loan servicers. A July report submitted to the White House by Secretary Mnuchin criticized the Education Department's oversight of the student loan servicing companies and reported that a number of loan servicing failures and inconsistent practices had caused financial harm to students. We in Congress have previously called on, on your agency to seek a court order to compel the Department of Education to provide access to information on student loans, and your agency has so far refused to do that. I want to follow up on your exchange with Mr. Stiles. Secretary DeVos has said that student loan servicers face, her words, appropriate federal oversight by the Department of Education. Do you agree with that statement? I agree it is their responsibility to oversee their contracts. Do, do you agree that they are currently providing appropriate federal oversight? I can't opine on how well they oversee the contractual terms and program requirements that they put into place that are their statutory Well, program. hang on, I think you can. They are currently not providing information that the CFPB has requested 
on student loan. They are, all, they are also, at the direction of my understanding of the White House, are not providing information to state's attorney general that are seeking legal action in addition to the CFPB. So you, as the head of the CFPB, are you doing your job to protect the students or are you, are you deferring to Secretary DeVos? Our purview of federal consumer financial law is absolutely one that we continue to pursue. Uh, we have other authorities, uh, as I have also pointed out. We have enforcement authority and we are using it in this space and we have an education responsibility. And we're working through, as I said, the ability to jointly go in and oversee the services I'm, consistent I'm, with our rule and our authority. I'm out of time, but we expect you within the executive branch to do the oversight that you were expected to do of other executive branch agencies. If you do not do that, we have to. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor, is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Appreciate you being here. Um, I, I know you don't weren't able to complete all the questions that you've gotten so far. Did, anything you want to add for the record that you feel like you didn't quite get out? I would say on the Department of Education issue, it, it is important and, and uh, to, to distinguish the responsibilities that we have. Uh, the Department of Education has a lot of authority under the Higher Education Act. They have the responsibility, obviously, to, to manage their contractors. So the CFPB has a lot of contractors as well, and it's our responsibility to make sure that they are uh, acting consistently with the terms of the loan, of the, of the contracts. Um, when it comes to this, this notion of supervision and oversight, we do have a larger participant rule in place that gives us responsibility and ability to examine the larger participants in the student loan servicing space. Uh, regardless of which types of loans they are uh, servicing, federal loans and private loans. And so that is what we are working with the Department of Education on. Uh, there are clearly some areas of overlap in question. We're, they set the program parameters and requirements, but we're looking at federal consumer financial law, and that's what we're working to, to finalize. It is, it's complex. Uh, we continue to carry out our responsibility, as I said, through other means, but we will resolve the supervisory issue soon. And so, I mean, are those issues statutory or, I mean, in other words, has Congress given you some laws that you're not really sure what to do with and do you have the authority to do that or do we need to go back to the books and give you a set of laws that you can actually implement and understand? In other words, do we need to do our job better here in Congress and give you laws that you can work on, work with? I haven't found anything, Congressman, I appreciate the question. I haven't found anything in this area, um, but it is certainly something we will look at. And I can assure uh, you and others on this topic that I believe the federal government has a responsibility, and so that is part of uh, the effort to work together to make sure that the Department of Education and the CFPB are sending the same message to servicers about what requirements are and uh, making that clear. So that's something that we continue to do. Sure. And is there any other topic you want to just, you got to say it round on, you didn't get quite get your, get your answer out? I, I would de defer back to any questions that you have, sir. Okay. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> one question I had, and I, I know we've discussed this in the past, but just in terms of thinking about Congress reasserting oversight over, over agencies, which Congress does, yours is a very unique agency in the way that it was originally structured. Um, I, I, um, do, I, I, think I, I think I've seen that you, you, just, you declined to defend the, the constitutional structure of your agency in court. Is that correct? Uh, the removal provisions associated with the director that are in, um, in the statute, that is what the government's position was in Salem Law when we petitioned the Supreme Court to take the case. Do you want to, do you want to go into why you chose to do that? Uh, Congressman, I can say it, it is something that I reviewed very carefully and took very seriously. Uh, Congress obviously provided a, a clear mission for this agency, uh, but there are some questions around, again, this, and I, I want the uncertainty to be resolved. Uh, the Supreme Court took the case, so I, I, they will hear it shortly and, and will come to resolution on that. Congress will have the opportunity to make any uh, changes or respond to that, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, I would very much like to see resolution on this question because it has hampered the CFPB's ability to carry out its mission uh, virtually since its inception. And so that, that uncertainty is really created by an unclearly written law. So that's, that's really on Congress to write a law that's clearer that everybody can understand. The more the courts get used, the, the less Congress does its job, the more the courts get used. And I think that's a, that reflects poorly on the legislative body's job of writing laws that are clear. 
do you agree with that or? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll leave that to you too, sir. That was, that was very respectful. Uh, just and um, shifting over in my remaining minute, uh, something that is certainly important to me is, is you putting up signposts uh, on a regulatory basis so that people know what to do. Uh, and, the, and the, the first time somebody hears about what they're supposed to do should actually be from the signpost and not people pulling them over and saying, hey, there was no speed limit here, but you were going too fast. Uh, what, what are you doing uh, in your role as a director of CFPB to put up the signposts so that people know what the speed limits are? The clarity and transparency of the rules is, is critically important. Uh, we are engaging uh, on an ongoing basis with entities to say, where is their uncertainty? Where is that hampering uh, the offering of things that are gonna be consumer beneficial in the marketplace? You know, what's holding you back? How do we address that? And so ongoing dialogue about that, continued provision of guidance, continued work on rulemaking matters that are gonna help provide additional clarity, all of that very my, important. My time is out, I yield back. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Mrs. Beatty, is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion. Is Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to the witness for being here today. Uh, I won't, for the sake of time, go over some of the things that uh, some of my other colleagues, especially Congresswoman Maloney, has asked about when we talk about the fair lending enforcement. But I will say that on page 63 of the report, it states that the Bureau filed one uh, lending enforcement, so I think you've already gotten the gist of how we feel about that. So let me go on and move to Financial Literacy and Education Commission. As you probably know, uh, I have spent a lot of time talking with you, your staff, and anyone who will listen about financial literacy and the benefits of it, because so many of the ramification for those who are the least of us, whether they're unbanked, underbanked, whether they are facing many of the issues that we deal with in this committee and with the work that you are doing. Also, as co-chair of the Financial and Economic Literacy Council, I spend a lot of time reading and looking at data. The Financial Literacy and Education Improvement Act that was passed in 2003 established a financial literacy and education committee that's chaired by the Treasury Secretary and whose vice chair is the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So that would be you. So the law states that the commission shall meet at least once every four months. Can you tell me when the last meeting uh, was held, how many meetings that you've held from 2019 to now, and what was something significant that you came up with? So I can tell you there, there have been substantial conversations around this. No, 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 just stick with me. How many, the law says you must have meetings. How many meetings? So we just, just give me that number first because the clock's gonna run down and I have several questions. How many meetings by the law have you held within the time frame the law asked? Uh, within the time frame the law passed, I-, I Ask, ask. Oh. Yeah, it seven. tells us, so ha have you had the number of meetings? Is, let's do a yes or no so we can move on. No. Okay, so that means, for the record, we have not met what the law states on something that you talk about and certainly is important to us. So I guess if you didn't meet as the law stated you should and your vice chair, you can't answer the other questions of what happened within those meetings per what the act is to do. So. Uh, the act does require reporting, and we have maintained the regular reporting. We've had so, a lot of so let me ask you this. meetings, too. If the law requires you to meet and you're telling me you've had reporting, why didn't you meet? And you're the vice chair. It's not like you're just one of the members without any control. You are the vice chair of a major committee that we work on, and, and you know me. You know what my issues are. I am very transparent about standing up for the people and trying to get things done within the law, within a committee. So it, let me just move to the next question. As you know, the civil penalty fund at your agency is used to compensate consumers who have been harmed by violation of consumer financial protection law. Some of this money may also be used by your organization to fund consumer education and financial literacy programs. Can you tell me 
if the Consumer Bureau has used any of the civil penalty money in the last six months for financial literacy education? Uh, we have not, Congresswoman, because we fund that through our regular operations. Okay, so can you tell me what you have used the money for in relationship which would help those individuals who could not be helped otherwise? The primary purpose of the civil penalty fund is to provide uh, restitution in cases where I'm going to cut you off again just, just because of time. I understand yeah. okay. what it's designed for. The answer is, did you meet what it was designed for? And to tell me and elaborate on that, please. Okay. Uh, yes, we continue to pay out uh, in just the Just tell me the things. You, give me three. Just give me three that you paid for. Uh, there, were, there were several cases. One was the, um, I think it was a Gamber? I don't remember what the, there was a, a case with respect to veterans, uh, and the entity was out of, basically was bankrupt, but we did a civil penalty fund uh, fine of $1, and then we have paid out, uh, I believe, hundreds of thousands in that case. Okay, it says to fund consumer education programs. So, so tell me a consumer education program and I'm sorry, my time has run out. I yield back. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Director Kraniger, welcome back to our committee. And uh, let me just first uh, thank you for your testimony that last year the Bureau requested Congress provide you with clear legal authority to supervise financial institutions for Military Lending Act compliance. You also said that the Bureau transmitted proposed legislative language that would achieve that goal. And I would note for the record that I've introduced that bill, H.R. 442, the Financial Protection for Our Military Families Act, in response to your request. I regret to state for the record that even though we sent a letter to the chairwoman asking for a markup on this bill that you have requested, we have been denied. So I want the record to reflect that the majority is preventing you from having supervisory authority over MLA compliance. My question relates to UDAP, Director Kraninger. Um, first, I want to thank you for your responsiveness on the issue. Last month, I sent you a letter uh, asking your plans to clarify the Bureau's definition of abusive and to outline how you would enforce the abusiveness standard on regulated entities. Uh, you responded to my letter, and, and I appreciate the policy statement. And I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record copies of my letter to you and your very timely response. Without objection, such um, as the for, for, First, I want to I ask you to follow up on Representative Maloney's question about Wells Fargo's problem with unauthorized accounts. Her question suggests that Dodd-Frank Section 1031, which added the undefined standard of abusive to the uh, unfair and deceptive acts in the list of prohibited activities, was essential to holding Wells Fargo accountable. Is that your position as well? Or was the pre-existing law that, that prohibited only unfair and deceptive acts and not abusive acts, was that enough to prohibit Wells Fargo's conduct? So with respect to, uh, I think I wanted to clarify as well, so thank you for the opportunity, that the 2016 consent order did, oh, it did. Oh, okay, understood. That, uh, so there, there is absolutely our ability to get the same amount of, of um, restitution and, and other penalties associated with unfairness alone. Right, so in uh, other so words, did determine right, that, in, yes. in other words, in, uh, opening an, un, uh, an account without the customer's permission, uh, that would have been prohibited under the pre-existing unfair and deceptive acts uh, law. In terms of the behavior in that case and with respect to that consent order that's public, I will say the answer is yes. Uh, I note to you, though, there are facts and circumstances in different cases that I, I don't want it to be generalized. Well, let me get to the second question because, you know, while the policy statement is a good first step and you should be commended for attempting to clarify this, I do think there's still a lot of work to do to ensure that regulated firms have clear rules of the road, which I know is your intent, uh, and I appreciate that. The guidance outlines generally how you will and will not enforce UDAP standards, and it's intended to ensure firms know what is expected of them. But unfortunately, I will tell you, I have heard from community banks in my district that the policy statement does not provide the clarity they need and still does not fully remove the uncertainty about what constitutes abusive. Um, as you know, ambiguous regulations can cause financial institutions to opt out of provided cer providing certain products and services, and that uncertainty trickles down to consumers through higher prices and less choice. 
So in the policy statement, the Bureau leaves open the potential for a rulemaking. Do you plan to conduct a rulemaking to def further define abusive, and what is your timeline? Uh, the policy statement leaves open uh, the ability, certainly, to, to enter into a rulemaking uh, action around this topic. I would say at this point, the, the Bureau really needs some more uh, engagement on the topic to well, get to a rulemaking. Let me, let me share some feedback from, from the, the, potential, the firms that would be regulated by this. Um, they certainly appreciate uh, uh, the policy statement avoiding this dual pleading idea of abusive with unfair deceptive violations arising from all the same facts. They like that. However, uh, given, uh, given the difficulties arising from the continued absence of the clear definition of abusive, would you consider separating abusive from unfair and deceptive and stipulate that practices only become abusive with higher penalties if the unfair and deceptive practices persist? So I, I, I understand the interest in that, and that has been raised, but I would say that Congress gave us you know, distinct authorities in these three areas, and so there is not necessarily a relationship between abusiveness and unfairness or deception yes, that, would, that would lead to that kind of an elevated I think um, the, standard. I hear you, but I think the concern is we still don't know what abusive means, yes. even with the guy. And so you know, unfair and deceptive, uh, that, that standard is well defined in the law, and that, would, that was, uh, Wells Fargo's conduct was prohibited under that standard. Abusive, we still don't know what that means. I would argue that what abusive should mean is if that conduct persists uh, even after they violated unfair and deceptive, that would, be, that would remove the ambiguity. Uh, and that's just a friendly the suggestion. I yield back. The has expired. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Porter, is recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Director Kreninger. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you um, if you would mind sharing with the committee um, what is what is a HECM loan, H-E-C-M? Uh, yes, it's a reverse mortgage. Um, and what are the basic qualifications for getting a reverse mortgage or HECM loan? HECM particularly, let's just start. In terms of what? Could I get one? In terms of, I get, I'm not, well, I don't know what your financial circumstances are in terms of whether or not you could get one. I'm 46 years old. Could I get a HECM loan? I can tell you what reverse mortgages are commonly used when individuals would like to take the equity out of their home and use it, obviously, to, to deal with the expenses, particularly those who have paid off their homes uh, and would like to uh, age in place in their homes. And so, so that's certainly the, the intended uh, recipient of a HECM loan. Or so HECM loans, you, for a HECM loan, you have to be 62 years or older. So I'm, I'm getting there. I'm going to get there. But I'm good several, like a decade plus short. Um, what happens to the title of your home when you take out a reverse mortgage? In terms of the lender being able to take the title? Well, let's, let's back up. What happens to the title of your home when you take out a regular mortgage? Well, it has a lien on it. Okay. So what happens to the title of your home when you take out a reverse there mortgage? There is a lien on it. Um, is the title transferred? I will say certainly in the financial crisis, there were a lot of challenges around where titles resided, whether okay. people had the proper documentation. Let me ask again, you about I'm the... Not, I'm not sure entirely where you're... Reclaiming where you're my time. Um, on the well, I want to understand what... I'm, what I'm driving at here is um, the questions I've been asking you are drawn from the CFPB's one sentence basic answers on their financial literacy page about reverse mortgages. So I'm trying to assess your understanding of reverse mortgages because you're in charge of educating the public about reverse mortgages. And this is a particularly confusing product. Um, so what are the triggers for having to repay a reverse mortgage? Congresswoman, again, I appreciate the, the test, but that is not why I'm here. We're here to talk about the policies that affect consumers in the marketplace. Well, and believe we me, having to, reclaiming my time, having to so repay having it. Having conversation would probably be, would be help, more helpful. Well, with all due respect, Ms. Director Kenninger, I get to decide what's helpful with my time, but I appreciate your suggestion. Um, let's go back to my question. What are the three triggers for having to repay a reverse mortgage? I will stipulate to you, Congresswoman, that I have not, I, I don't have it in front of me in terms of what the CFPB has on its website, how it defined the triggers, and what converse, you know, what, what kind of questions and answers 
there are about reverse mortgages. Among the many thousands of uh, pieces of information that we seek to educate consumers by, I'd also offer that it's generally those that would be thinking about entering into a reverse okay. mortgage. I just reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. You've stipulated that you don't mortgage. know when or what triggers require someone to have to pay a reverse mortgage. Um, Madam Chairwoman, well, I would like you're to looking for a particular reclaiming answer that is printed on a piece of paper that I don't have in front of me. So I, that's what I would stipulate. Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to introduce into um, to the record the one page, um, one sentence answers from the CFPB's website about reverse mortgages. Without objection, such is the order. Um, let's move on to medical debt. Um, uh, is it permissible for a debt collector to use LinkedIn to reach out to a um, consumer who owes a medical debt? So with respect to debt collection and communication with consumers, there is clearly a lot of uncertainty in that space, which is why we have sought to engage in rulemaking. Um, the FDCPA uh, absolutely has restrictions on uh, the communications that would be uh, really uh, abusive. They cannot be uh, ongoing communications that are uh, in the consumer that are we're claiming my time. Let's talk about your proposal because you wanted to talk about the policies. That was your suggestion. So let's talk about that. Would your proposal prohibit sending a direct message to someone on social media? Uh, the only way that a debt collector could contact a consumer is if the consumer has used that means of communication in the proposal. I would tell you again, the proposal is still under consideration. I want to ask a clarifying question, if I may. Use that medium to communicate with the debt collector, or if I have a LinkedIn account, am I consenting to receive debt collection notifications there? Uh, absolutely. Merely having that account is not uh, approval or, or leave for anyone to con communicate to you that way. Interesting. Thank you. My time has expired. The gentlewoman's time has expired, and I would say to the witness that with both uh, Ms. Porter and uh, Ms. Beatty, you may respond to them in writing for the record. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Granger. Thanks for being in the committee today, and I appreciate your chance to be in Arkansas recently and uh, do a roundtable with uh, our community banks and also with consumer groups uh, in the city that was well received and appreciate you taking that time to do it. I want to talk a bit about uh, the qualified mortgage issue. I'm sure you've addressed that this morning. You know, with interest rates falling, falling to historically low levels over our careers and recently in the last three years, jobs increasing and real wages increasing, do you find it concerning that we actually are seeing a deterioration in Fannie and Freddie's underwriting standards? In other words, they are having DTIs, larger percentage of loans, well over 43% DTI, and they're making loans at lower credit scores, uh, and therefore they're taking on more risk. And isn't that sort of counterintuitive to an environment where we have rising wages, more jobs, and the lowest interest rates in a long time. I can tell you, Congressman, we, we clearly pay close attention to what we think is happening in the mortgage markets. Uh, I defer to FHFA on, on the credit box and, and the policies they want to set uh, with, with the GSEs around um, you know, what type of underwriting they do. Uh, but I can tell you this is very much the heart of the question as we talk about what the patch uh, has done in the marketplace and what uh, replacement of that going forward looks like. Uh, it, it is evident that the qualified mortgage, in addition to the patch, uh, has, is the vast majority of the marketplace. And so figuring out how we maintain um, affordable access to mortgages and at the same time, uh, the very uh, clear parameters of ability to repay that were uh, originally conceived of in the qualified mortgage and allow for some non-qualified mortgages and that um, that market to really uh, expand is is very much the challenge that we're looking at in this rule. And that's true, but I mean, I think this Congress was very clear back during the debates after the crash that one of the principal contributors to the crash was a competition and laxity in underwriting uh, led, including our government-sponsored enterprises, sadly, leading a spiraling downward 
pressure to, for people to have more and more lax underwriting standards. Do you take this debate to mean that people want laxer underwriting standards? Oh, definitely not, sir, and thank you for going there, too, so I could specifically say that the requirements of the statute around ability to repay, uh, verification of income, consideration of, of debt-to-income ratio uh, remain, uh, regardless of, of what else we take into consideration in the rulemaking process, those things continue. So is it your vision? I was looking at all the random, all the, I shouldn't say random, all the comments that you got in your advance notice for proposed rulemaking. And uh, a lot of people suggest that a single factor like DTI is not satisfactory. But of course, uh, banks that make loans on a regular basis, the ones that have an outstanding track record all have best practices for that underwriting. And what would you say when you read something that says relying on a single factor is a bad idea, using a hard DTI cutoff is unwise, these are some of the comments you got. How complicated do we want to make it for our originators in terms of determining credit ability to repay? Well, having a, a bright line test is clearly what people are looking for, but it is clear that with respect to the at least the 43% uh, line as to what is a qualified mortgage on debt to income ratio and the requirements in Appendix Q as to how you can determine that, what type of income you can take into account, how the debt is calculated, uh, the challenges for self-employed individuals to meet the requirements that are in Appendix Q. Uh, we've got a lot of comments that came in re regarding that. So that's largely the question. And, and so as we looked at where is the line? If it's not 43%, if we're actually keeping out what are good performing loans uh, from being made as qualified mortgages, you know, what, what is the right answer here? Is there another um, lens through which we can look at that, which is why I noted in the letter that our proposed rule uh, will propose an alternative to particularly 43% and look at a pricing threshold. And what's your timing on uh, responding with a, a proposal? May. Uh, I said no later than May, we will put out our notice of proposed rulemaking and we expect and, and want rigorous comment on it. Good, I thank the director and I yield back. Thank you, the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, director, for being here again to report to us on uh, uh, the progress uh, and uh, the questions that we have regarding uh, the supervisory role uh, that you're the mission that is uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, I want to go back to the issue of student loans and student loan oversight. Uh, do you have, does your agency have super, uh, supervisory role over federal student loans? Uh, we issued a larger participant rulemaking that, yes provided, no, just, that, that, no. that provided the uh, no. oversight of larger participants in that student loan servicing space for both federal and, and private loans, yes. That was really a simple yes or no question. Do well, it's you have the larger, it's supervision the lar over federal student loans? Yes or no? We supervise the larger participants okay. I, I, in that federal, stu in that federal it's student loan. Strange place space. to start. Um, I want to follow up on my colleague's questioning. Talk about uh, your ongoing failure to do your duty uh, in conducting oversight of student loan servicers specifically. Uh, in the heels of you coming here, uh, you did. I see. I think three days ago issue. Uh, enter into an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the Department of Education um, for information sharing. I believe that's correct. February the 3rd, you entered into that uh, because the Department of Ed had torn these up uh, previously. I want to talk to you about the MOU that my colleague, Mr. Caston, referenced. Uh, that's the second MOU, supervisory MOU, um, that you've been promising us um, so that you could resume your oversight responsibilities. Uh, where are you on entering in the second MOU? So we are still discussing that, but what we are doing is working on a joint examination program. We're going to send some examiners detailed to the Department of Education so that we can work together on exactly how we're going to do this. They want to go in and oversee their contractors. Can I stop the you? contract requirements, Just a and a we want to oversee federal consumer financial law. Let's layer in last May, you revealed that the Department of Education was entirely blocking your supervisory role over uh, the servicers, federal student loan servicers. 
uh, because they were not uh, giving you the information based on a, a decree by the Department of Education. Isn't that correct? Information was being blocked based on uh, what the Department of Education had told servicers, correct? You, uh, you told yes, us. Yes, the, the, the language is in the letter, uh, and that is precisely why we're having the conversations with Ed about the best did and most productive way to go forward together. Did you find that um, categorical blocking of information and oversight, your, blocking your oversight responsibilities troubling? I, I, I did, and I put that in the letter to Congress, but I'd also note that we Did you put that in the letter to, to, course to the Secretary of Education and ask her to undo uh, what she had done in terms of blocking your oversight responsibilities? Uh, I have spoken with her. We're working together to get to, frankly, an even more productive place around how we do this. They have a responsibility to oversee their contractors, and we need to do that in concert with them so that we are doing our Last time, requirements. I'll, I'll reclaim my time uh, because uh, a conversation with someone who said uh, that you're not going to be able to do your oversight is it doesn't seem like the effective way to change that outcome. Uh, what have you directed your student loan ombudsman to do regarding the second MOU? Is he in direct negotiations as well, Mr. Cameron? Uh, he is certainly aware of, but he is not responsible for those negotiations. Who's responsible for those negotiations? Brian Schneider, who is the head of supervision, enforcement, and fair lending. And, and why would you not have the ombudsman a part of it? Uh, the ombudsman responsibility under the statute, and frankly has been the case since the beginning of the agency, it was also the responsibility of the prior ombudsman, is around, uh, particularly around complaints and around larger programmatic but if there issues. Is, if you're blocked from doing the supervisory role, how can the ombudsman uh, actually do that job? Um, well, his he, MOU is concluded, and he is and has been doing his job, including reporting to Congress on the me. issues he sees in the market. All right. Speaking of the student loan ombudsman, a position that was left open for 300 days until it was finally filled last year, uh, what, where does the staffing stand for the student loan ombudsman? Um, so he is in place and he has a plan. We've got a How many people are going to... What does his support staff look like? Uh, he has partial support staff right now and he's about to get a full-time person soon. He does uh, not again, have a single staffer? Only, but he is not the only person working on We have a $1.6 trillion dollar student loan problem in this country. It took 300 days to appoint a student loan ombudsman. You appointed somebody who came from the services uh, industry. You now have a Department of Education who has blocked your oversight ability. You have been weak in being able to change that. And he is not staffed yet. I find that strikingly against the mission of your department. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, and, and thank you, Ranking Member McHenry, for uh, arranging the uh, hearing today. And Director Craniger, thank you for being here. It's good to see you again. Um, I want to start off by saying that I joined my House Republican colleagues on the amicus brief urging the Supreme Court to decide that the CFPB's structure is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Uh, to give Congress the opportunity to fix it and make the CFPB more accountable to Congress. Notwithstanding these shared concerns, I do want to thank you for your work as CFPB director to streamline overly broad regulations, to build more cooperative relationships with businesses and consumers, and work with members of Congress to protect our constituents. Director Craniger, uh, I'd like to ask you about something the chairwoman referenced uh, at the start of this hearing. It seems to me that a healthy environment and an effective CFPB is one that creates an environment in which the consumer isn't harmed to begin with and businesses comply with the law in the first place. Is the amount of money collected through restitution, in your opinion, indicative of the efficacy of the CFPB? No, it absolutely is not the, and it's certainly not the only, uh, to the extent that it is one. If the CFPB under the prior director collected more money than the CFPB today, does that necessarily mean that the CFPB is doing less to protect consumers or failing to fulfill its mandate? Uh, no, I certainly posit that it is not an indication of that necessarily. Thank you. I, I'm struck that if we were to measure other arms of the government, say the Justice Department, uh, by perhaps uh, they measure their success or their efficacy by the length of sentences handed out uh, to those who are convicted uh, that 
you know, that might be a, an allergy, and I would submit that that's probably not what we should be looking at as a measure of the success of our federal agencies and law enforcement and, uh, agencies and regulators. I also want to call attention to uh, some of the lines of questioning that I've heard today, as I believe they might illustrate a concern, an ongoing concern, and maybe the concern I've just been expressing, um, kind of the pop quiz nature of some of the questions that get directed to you, and I realize you, you make the big, big bucks, so that's why you get to answer these questions, but I think that they kind of underscore um, the concern that I and I think other uh, colleagues of mine have about regulatory um, approaches taken by the federal government, not just the CFPB, but other regulators, and that is that it, I don't think it's ever useful when the regulated feel like it's a gotcha moment when the regulator comes to town to visit them. And so I would encourage you in that spirit and, and with that uh, experience fresh on your mind uh, to encourage your staff uh, to think of the job that they have as one of helping businesses serve customers in compliance with the regulatory framework that's been put in place helping them succeed and thereby helping customers have better experiences uh, with, the, with the service providers that they seek out. So I hope you'll take that to heart and uh, appreciate that. I want to turn now uh, for just a moment. In your testimony, you mentioned that the CFPB has asked that Congress give CFPB authority to supervise financial institutions for Military Lending Act compliance. But one thing I've always, I'm always concerned about is when our regulators get a little too ambitious and then we're faced with mission creep. Under current law, who is charged with enforcing the MLA? So we do have the authority to take enforcement action under the MLA, but what we don't have is that supervisory authority. Uh, and I will say the prudential regulators also have uh, the authority with respect to uh, you know, the institutions under their purview. If the CFPB is given this explicit authority, how would you assure Congress that the CFPB, under your tenure or otherwise, wouldn't then take, um, try to take that authority and broaden its influence over DOD policies that may have, uh, that may have a financial services nexus? Oh. And, and this is an important distinction, certainly, Congressman. It aligns to the conversation we just had about prevention of harm. That's what this is aimed at. Our supervisory tool is really the best way to, to work with institutions to ensure they understand the requirements of law and that they are in compliance with them without the gotcha moment, uh, without the public uh, fanfare or flogging. And so that's, that's really what we're seeking, is that ability to have examiners go in, uh, particularly to non-banks in this, have that level playing field in, uh, amongst the entities that are providing loans um, and would need to comply with the MLA. Thank you, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicolas, who is also the Vice Chair for the Committee on Financial Services, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the, the committee for their patience. I have a, um, a delegation from Guam of about nearly 50 students who are here from the other side of the world, and I just finished uh, um, kind of running them around the Capitol real quick and showing them some special sites. So I just wanted to, um, for the record, uh, mention them and welcome them to our nation's capital. Uh, Director Craninger, welcome. Uh, it's nice to see you again. Uh, when you were last here, uh, I brought up something that I thought was pretty uh, concerning, and that was the uh, employee uh, surveys with respect to um, <clears throat> uh, their workplace, how they felt, uh, whether or not they felt supported. And in our conversation, I brought up how um, their prior surveys uh, reflected higher figures and their most recent survey showed a steep drop off on some of those figures. Uh, have you um, revisited those areas and do you have any update for us on those issues? Uh, yes, Congressman. I think I told you that we established a workforce effectiveness committee and really they're working through a lot of, of the issues that we believe are really root causes of that. Um, I'd say that the annual employee survey is important. It's, it's a point in time. Uh, we've actually since had another AES uh, conducted and released. And in fact, we have seen improvement. Uh, I'm not fully satisfied with the results of, of the latest AES either. And I can assure you we won't rest on our laurels over this. But taking you know, really all of that to heart including all of the engagement with our employees, um, replacing, frankly, a lot of, of uh, staff. I think the, the end of the hiring freeze and the institution of my staffing planning 
is, is a big part of improvement and the survey was taken like right when I made that decision in August. Um, so I, I hope that we'll continue to see improvement and, and frankly in my engagement with employees regularly we continue to see that. I, I think it's very important for us to um, really pay close attention to the, um, those numbers and, and how they track to, towards improvement because um, you know, with all the uh, back and forth that we can, we can have in politically charged environments, um, one of the areas that we can definitely find um, solace in is when we have uh, uh, employees in the rank and file who are very, very confident that they're effective and they're able to do their jobs as, uh, as mandated. And so um, with respect to those areas that uh, um, still need improvement and uh, uh, with respect to your evaluation of what was impacting um, those, uh, those responses, um, can you share with us what some of those con general areas of concern were and what uh, some of the remedies are that you're implementing to, to, to correct them? One of, one of them certainly was leadership engagement with employees. And I can tell you again, the way that I've served in government and what I brought to the CFPB was very much of a, an approachable, uh, accessible uh, leader who is actually going to engage with staff and, and not beg away from any questions. So I have made a point of going to uh, you know, staff meetings and, and taking questions and having uh, all hands meetings of walking around uh, the building and really making sure that all of our senior leaders are doing that. Um, you know, you can get busy, the, the higher up in an organization you get, and so the ability to really make sure that you're accessible to everyone. Uh, we also are doing a number of things to get more real-time employee feedback on problems and issues. We've made some real changes in just some of the pain points around some of the issues like travel and, and some of the, you know, paperwork and bureaucratic requirements there. But I will say the staffing planning changes are a really big difference. I mean, seeing new hires come in, uh, seeing that support, uh, that's, that's something that is already making um, you know, a big difference. Okay, um, one of the um, lessons that I learned from uh, some very, very uh, talented managers is that when you, bring, when you bring management in, you gotta give them roughly you know, half a year to a year to really learn the organization and begin implementing changes to, to um, help make things better. And uh, you're basically coming along on that uh, on that same track, um, but going forward, um, after all the implementation, all the analysis, I would I would argue that these next round of employee results, uh, with respect to how they come in on that survey, is going to uh, be a direct reflection on whether or not the improvements that you're speaking of are actually taking hold. And so I look forward to seeing those numbers and being able to get a firm uh, snapshot of. Uh, the effectiveness of your leadership with respect to how the employees perceive that. Thank you so much for being here, Director. I yield back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Craninger. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your leadership in the organization. I think you're doing a good job. Um, and your engagement with members of Congress is, is refreshing. I know we've sent uh, many letters and engaged with your office on, on different issues, and you've been very responsive and open, and I appreciate that. I do have three areas. If, if we could hit all three of those, it would be great. Um, uh, the first is going to be remittance transfers. The second is going to be uh, trade exemptions for uh, nonprofits and charities. And the last will be the rule on uh, debt collection. So um, thank you for what you've been doing on the remittance rule. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking action and uh, making rule proposals. It's much better than the status quo. Do have some concerns, though. Um, about the proposed caps and banks being able to estimate the exchange rates and third parties' fees, it could still cause some market disruption, and which is inevitably going to affect consumers whenever uh, there is a change in regulation as most businesses try to operate within the laws and regulations. And if there is a change, uh, there's usually the consumer that is affected. Um, I'm not sure that the number of transfers a bank makes in a year is, is exactly relevant to being able to estimate uh, properly, especially when it comes to the smaller banks, which many of those in rural communities could have an inordinate number of transfers depending on the, the makeup of that community. But really my question uh, is, would you consider allowing banks to estimate the exchange rate and fees if they are unable to establish 
a necessary relationship if it's for reasons beyond their control. So, Congressman, we're up against the requirement and statute on this, as, as you well know. So that's why we're seeking to mitigate it, particularly for smaller entities that are looking to maintain their customer relationship with their, with their customers for this service. Um, there is the ability uh, with certain countries, obviously, to, to get right. the country list updated, and that's the mechanism by which we want to uh, hopefully address this or at least help and assist. But the comment period's open for the rulemaking. It closed, or maybe it just closed, I think. Regardless, we, we will take in the comments on this uh, and look to, to final action uh, to try to at least mitigate some of the impacts you're concerned about. Well, if you could, I, I, a big concern is especially in smaller banks in areas that may have a large number of transfers, but yet the countries they deal with, there could be changing uh, quite often. Uh, the other is the uh, compliance deadline of July 21st. It's short for some banks to actually uh, get in compliance. To know if you were considering maybe extending the period or giving a, a uh, extending the compliance deadline for uh, uh, providing a transition period for some of those banks. Uh, we are working rigorously to get that final rule out in time to support a transition, and that deadline is statutory too. So we're, we, you know, that is that is something that we have to maintain. Okay, appreciate that. Quickly on the other uh, two issues, uh, past. It's legislation that uh, we passed out of this House a couple of times. It's in the Senate. It's called the Build Act, which would allow nonprofits uh, uh, such as Habitat for Humanity uh, give them exemption from uh, complying with the new TRID rules, but be able to go back and utilize the pre-TRID uh, disclosures because they are providing a zero interest mortgage and there's no reason they need to do disclosures for uh, variable rates and things that they're not involved in. Uh, we haven't been able to get it out of the Senate yet. Um, would you consider uh, providing administrative relief to those types of uh, charities under TRID? So we're doing the assessment of TRID now. Uh, I've had uh, certainly heard this issue from you and others, sir. They have not come entirely with us with the same uh, articulation of the challenge. And so we want to work through the assessment process to see um, you know, what's here and, and get some real facts on the ground. So encourage those that are affected by this or your office has some, some additional data around this. We, we absolutely want to do what we okay. can consistent with the law to address it. And, and we'll provide that data as quickly as possible. And real quickly, the last is the uh, uh, debt collection. I want to just make sure we clarify whether or not the, the debt collection applies to uh, first party debt collectors. I know a lot of our banks and credit unions are concerned about that. Or would you be able to clarify? The, the, the rule, rule that the uh, pro that the CFPB pro proposed is just third party debt collectors uh, under the FDCPA. And they're just concerned that it may not be as clear. If you could clarify that, we appreciate it. Again, thank you for your service and thank you for the work you do. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Axney, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, Director Craninger, for being here. Appreciate it. Um, I want to ask a couple more questions about the memorandum of understanding that you just signed with the Department of Education. Uh, just so we're clear, that MOU just covered sharing information about complaints, um, and is that something that we were already doing? Is that correct? There was ongoing activity, but, but that MOU was rescinded two years ago, and we wanted to obviously formalize the relationship and the responsibilities, so that's what's been done. Okay. Um, when was then the last time that the CFPB was able to properly supervise student loan services? So we do supervise student loan servicers on an ongoing basis, um, particularly in the private education loans. The, the issue that I, I understand and know you're getting to uh, is supervision of an examination of the larger participants in the federal student loan space. Uh, and so we are in our ongoing conversations with the Department of Education over that. We continue to use our enforcement authorities in this area, uh, but I very much want to work with them to make sure that we're getting, uh, you know, the ability to examine, because that's about preventing uh, issues from happening. Um, Department of Education is going to take some detailees from us, so we're designing a program together where they can go oversee contract terms, and we can go in and oversee federal financial consumer law. Okay. Well, given the fact that uh, the CFPB has received numerous complaints um, about student loan debt, and that's one of the, that's the biggest area where you're uh, seeing uh, complaints, 
can we get an answer here? Because I know a lot of my colleagues have been asking this as well. Let me be very direct. When will, when will the CFPB resume supervising and examining the companies, companies who are servicing more than a trillion dollars of federal loans? A date. I can tell you soon. I had pledged to you that by the next time I, I testified, which is now a little earlier than it was originally intended to be, that I would have progress. And I am excited about the fact that we have the, you know, the MOU signed on complaints. We have an agreement that we're working towards on. So, so leads, you know, I and we a, appreciate claim, reclaiming my time. Appreciate this. I spent a decade in state government implementing policy in, in departments just like yours at high at the highest level. So I get what needs to be done. I was usually always able to articulate a time frame by which we'd be able to deliver that service. Tell me a time frame. Just give us a time frame. Not you've had these conversations. What are we talking about here? Uh, we are talking about very soon. Meaning this quarter. Uh, by June, uh, what are you, literally, what, you say very soon, that's a... I can tell a, you absolutely this year. Absolutely this so, year. So we could be looking at continuing to not see this examination, this oversight until December, is Again, what I'm hearing. Again, there are other tools that we're using. We are using our enforcement tool, and we can use our education tool, and we are talking to the Department of Education to resolve this as quickly as possible. Okay, well, please get back to us. Uh, that's not a good enough answer. You know, we have, as, as I mentioned, this is the, the biggest complaints to the CFBB come to the student loan servicing part of it. Our kids uh, and adults who have gone back to school to get retrained, to relearn, are experiencing severe amounts of debts, as, as we all know, and limiting them from being able to purchase homes uh, to get the opportunity in life that they need. So the fact that this is the biggest issue that we're facing in your department and nobody can give us any time frame around when you're going to resume actually overseeing it is really problematic. So please, I expect to have an answer to this body uh, in a timely manner, and I'll, we'll be following up on that. Um, you agree that the CFPB has the authority to supervise student loan services? We issued a larger participant rule that, that does extend to federal student loan servicers in that, again, that category. Okay, so we've established that the CFPB has authority to do it. Uh, so then why is it acceptable that the CFPB has gone more than two years without the ability to properly supervise student loan servicers? Again, we are using uh, other tools at play here to, to undertake our responsibilities in this space, including, as you noted, complaints uh, are an area where we absolutely are addressing particular students' issues and what they are submitting um, to us and to the Department of Education, and we have transparency between those things. We continue well, to raise the issues that are programmatic uh, around the challenges in this space. Re reclaiming my time. I absolutely appreciate that complaints piece, but this seems a heck of a lot like how you've decided to supervise the Military Lending Act. Uh, the executive branch is simply deciding that con contrary to congressional intent, they don't want to actually supervise large corporations and protect consumers based on extremely weak and frankly incorrect legal justification. If I could so tell you, though, to be clear, to be clear director, reclaiming to my time, to be clear, director, this really looks like you're abandoning your responsibilities to protect consumers. Thank you. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The witness is requested to provide an answer in writing for the record. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you also, Director, for being here. Uh, I'd like to read some sections of an article that the Wall Street Journal's editorial board published earlier this week. Uh, it goes like this. Sometimes it feels as if Richard Cordray is commanding his former minions at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, Witness the Bureau's lawsuit last week against Citizens Bank for transgressions it long ago disclosed and rectified. Five years later, that is after Citizens Bank self-reported and then fixed their truth in lending issues, the Bureau is now pouncing even though the one-year statute of limitations that governs its legal claims has expired. The lawsuit recalls Mr. Cordray's drive-bys against businesses during the Obama administration. I'm a small business, I can tell you about that. Uh, but President Trump's appointee, Kathy Craninger, has promised to focus on preventing consumer harm and to encourage self-reporting by financial institutions. So I guess I'd say, what's, what's that all about? Uh, Congressman, I, I appreciate you raising it. I know many people have read it. Uh, I can't comment on specific cases that the filings will speak for themselves, uh, so I encourage people to read them. 
I can tell you that everything you just said is absolutely my focus, that we are focused on prevention of harm. We absolutely want entities to be um, seeking to join us in being compliant with the law, but no one should mistake fairness and reasonableness for weakness. Okay, thank you. Uh, dur during Director Cordray's tenure, I was very critical uh, personally of the way he ran the CFPB, and when I see things like this still happening, uh, it doesn't inspire confidence that meaningful reforms have been made to get this agency under control. So uh, I want to give you a chance to respond to this if you want, or maybe you already have, but also specifically want to know if you personally signed off on this action before the complaint was filed in Rhode Island. Uh, I sign off on every uh, enforcement action decision that when, when it goes public. Okay, good to know. So last year, some of my colleagues and I wrote a letter to you in reference to a major threat to our economy and the scrutinization markets. Uh, the former CFP di PB director and administration made a significant mistake when filing a proposed consent order against 15 securitization trusts known as the National Collegiate Student Loan Trust. Uh, this action threatens the stability of scrutinization markets and impacts all Americans, so from, from people seeking loans from houses to cars. So the consent order wrongly penalizes investors in the trust themselves, which adds significant uncertainty that could curtail the, uh, the investment, reduce consumers' access to credit, and have broad ramifications throughout the economy. So as I mentioned earlier, some of my colleagues and I have written to you on this matter and I'm concerned that it continues to be under-addressed. Uh, does the CFPB have plans to review cases where the Bureau has improperly applied its mandate? Uh, so, Congressman, because you're asking a generalized question, I, I can respond. I cannot respond on a specific case here beyond the filings in court. Um, but I can tell you that, that absolutely we're looking at um, every action and stand by every action that, that we have put uh, into court. And we'll continue to look if, if facts change and as things change, uh, we will keep you apprised and certainly keep the courts apprised. Okay. Uh, I recently introduced the Preserving Small Business Lending Act, uh, which would repeal the onerous small business data collection requirement that was mandated uh, that your agency uh, implement in Dodd-Frank. Uh, this new rule will increase the cost of credit by forcing compliance with more regulations and more red tape for financial institutions and small businesses alike. So from your public remarks on this issue, it seems like you're aware of these potential negative effects uh, of implementing this rule incorrectly. So while my obvious preference is that my bill uh, will ultimately be signed into law and this rule never goes into effect, how do you plan on uh, mitigating the negative consequences for the parties subjected to the new rule? The Congress in the Dodd-Frank Act clearly required us to move forward with this rulemaking, uh, and obviously we will continue to do that and, until told otherwise, uh, if told otherwise, by Congress. And we're doing this as judiciously as we can. I can tell you there is a lawsuit, so we're in litigation over precisely this issue. What is the timeline for issuance? The next step is the small, um, uh, the Sabrifa process, the Small Business Regulatory uh, Enforcement uh, forget now what Sabrifa stands for, but regardless, that process by which small businesses that are impacted um, have the opportunity to comment on the proposal. So that's, we're developing the proposal to put into Sabrifa. Uh, we've said that that would happen um, by the fall. And so we're gonna look to see what we can do to, to mitigate while carrying out what Congress told us to do. Well, thank you, you've got a tough job. We stand here to work with you, okay? Thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, Madam Director, uh, uh, during October the 17th Senate uh, Banking Committee hearing, you stated you would rather have, have an adversarial relationship with the uh, Department of Education. Since then, the Bureau and DOA released uh, a memorandum. Can you go into further details on what that memorandum uh, states? Uh, yes, sir. The, the MOU is regarding information sharing of complaints from students. Uh, so we outlined our responsibilities and their responsibilities, depending on the type of loan, and frankly, our commitment to work together to address even things that are programmatic in their space that touch on financial consumer protection law. And so that's, that's where um, we wanted to make sure that we eliminate any gaps there and that we are coordinating 
on how we help students in this space and the direction that we give to servicers. Okay, I have a lot of students in my uh, district, and that's the reason why I'm very concerned about it. Uh, uh, and so you plan, so you have a plan to work with uh, uh, the Secretary uh, of Education to uh, ensure exams are able to, uh, uh, examine are able to investigate problems within long-serving uh, long companies? Uh, yes, we are going to send detailees over to the Department of Education to work jointly on how we can carry this program out. So they, they have contract terms that do relate to federal consumer law, and so figuring out how we can go in together and jointly carry out our respective responsibilities. So we're gonna design a program to do that, uh, which I think is really positive. So we're going to um, conclude an MOU related to that uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, do you feel with this uh, uh, collaboration or memorandum uh, that there will, you'll be able to get bad actors out of the student loan uh, process? It will certainly help prevent harm to consumers. I can tell you with respect to bad actors, we continue to maintain our enforcement authority and, and we will use it and, and have been using it. Okay. Uh, with an increase of 7% of, of consumer complaints, why has the Consumer Bureau seen a decrease in the staff by 14% in the last two years? Congressman, there was a hiring freeze instituted as part of the transition. Uh, and I actually lifted that last summer. I have a staffing plan where I have uh, empowered managers to tell me if they need additional resources to carry out the mission. And we are in the, the process, frankly, of, of building back up to those target staffing levels. Uh, we've had new hiring classes every two weeks, um, 10 more people this past Monday, too. And it's a really targeted thing to say we want clarity over roles, responsibilities, resource needs, uh, and I've empowered, as I said, the managers to make those decisions and, and to really manage that on an ongoing basis. Don't just fill the position because somebody is leaving at the same level. Let's really assess, this is what we need. Okay, we're gonna go try to get that. And so it's, uh, frankly, the flexibilities Congress has given us with respect to how we can manage ourselves that gives us the ability to do that and be really uh, pointed and targeted. And that's where we are. I think we've, we've got, um, frankly, we're, back on a buildup to get to the right staffing levels. Uh, from your assessment, do you feel like uh, it's difficult to retain staff in that particular area? Um, there hasn't been any one particular area where it's a challenge. I can say government-wide, we have challenges in cybersecurity. Uh, there are challenges, again, with, with lawyers with particular skill sets and because they're valuable to, to, frankly, other entities besides the government. Uh, so we are, you know, looking at that and making sure we are um, recruiting in a, in a smart way as well. Uh, economists can be very hard to, to attract, and, and so we're looking at what we can do to both build the pool uh, and, and certainly retain those and help them have a career ladder and, and trajectory that, that is going to be, uh, I guess it's going to be positive to them. Okay, and I'll try to get this soon. I recognize the Consumer Bureau commitment to staff diversity. However, based on the number of uh, the females and minority workforce have remained the same, why is this so, you know? Uh, we actually have increased uh, our minority levels and female levels. We're 50-50 in the whole agency and 50-50 at the leadership level. Uh, our level of minority leadership as well is, is increased. I apologize, I don't remember precisely what it is. Uh, but we are doing uh, very well compared to other agencies, uh, and we will continue to make that a, a huge priority. Okay, thank you for that, I yield back. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Heck, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director, I'd like to resume our discussion slash argument about whether or not you indeed have the authority to conduct supervisory exams with respect to compliance with the Military Lending Act. You're wrong, I'm right. And the consequence of that is that considerations related to national security are compromised, and service members are hurt. But maybe we can start with something on which we agree. Would you agree that a 20-year-old sailor whose job it is to program a Tomahawk missile in the Persian Gulf should not be stressing out about whether or not their car's getting repossessed? 
I would agree that I definitely would you don't want agree? Them to be would you agree out. that service members have historically, as amply documented in a Department of Defense study, been targeted by payday lenders with predatory practices? I, I would say they absolutely are a vulnerable population for precisely the note that the, the you would not agree that they've been mentioned. targeted. I think that's a strong term, but I think there are lots of vulnerable I would populations that who are, is, in fact, targeted. Then I would yes. submit to you, sh you should read the report of our own Department of Defense. Uh, understood. I, I have seen the report, sir, that you're mentioning, and I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just, there, there are dated times, there are different locations, but vulnerable populations do get targeted. I concede that, absolutely. And, and would you agree that part of the characteristics of vulnerability are, for service members is that we're talking about relatively young people who are in paid jobs for the first time, who are relocated often, and who, in fact, have stresses related to deployment and the like. Yes. So you maintain that you don't have the authority to conduct supervisory exams. Are you aware that the person who wrote the bill, United States Senator Jack Reed, said specifically that you do? Uh, yes, Congressman, okay. I've had that conversation. Were you aware as well? that Colonel Paul Cantwell, who was the former director of the Office of Service Members Affairs for your office, said that throughout the years under Director Cordray that these exams were conducted, that he never received a single complaint about them? I will concede to you, sir, that I don't think that's necessarily the measure of whether or not... Were you aware that he said that? Spread. Yes, I am aware that he said that. In the midst of all the litigation associated with CFPB as to the constitutionality of your governance structure and the like, can you cite a single instance during the six-plus years of those exams being conducted that a lawsuit was ever filed against CFPB because you did not have the authority to conduct them? Again, not the measure that I would use as to whether this is an appropriate interpretation. That's not the but, question. But, but no, it has not actually occurred. So, so the prime sponsor says it was what we intended clearly. The person in your office associated with it said nobody ever complained. And in fact, there's no lawsuit been filed. Would you not also acknowledge that under uh, UDAP, you have broad but unambiguous authority? There is broad authority under UDAP, certainly, but the question of which And here's markets, the language under Dodd-Frank, which you laws. say does not give you the authority. Dodd-Frank confirms that the Bureau can administer periodic exams for, I'm quoting the law director, assessing compliance with the requirements of federal consumer law, B, obtaining information about the activities and compliance systems or procedures of such person, referring to an entity, and C, detecting and assessing risk to consumers and to markets for consumer financial products and services, end quote. That's the law. You have the authority and you should start doing it. You also claim to like data. I like data too. In my state alone, 737 complaints received from service members to your office. It used to be that your office under the Office of Service Members Affairs published an annual report that indicated the number of complaints <coughs> that had been submitted. <coughs> the last one was 13 months ago. Do you plan to reissue another Office of Service Members Affairs report documenting and setting forth the number of complaints that service members have submitted? Uh, we're continuing to Do you plan? Do you plan to issue the report has had been done throughout the uh, history of the agency. Can she answer, Madam Chair? Uh, the Chair will grant uh, the witness time to answer on this question. The Office of Service Members Affairs annual report will be issued actually imminently consistent with its deadline. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Director. Great to see you here on the Hill again. Appreciate the work you and your team do to protect America's consumer. 
consumers and, uh, and frankly, to clarify the law as it exists. Uh, frankly, uh, one of the concerns that we've had in the structure that's been shared across the aisles is everything depends on who the director is. And, uh, and, and we really do need to change that structure as has been highlighted by a number of members. But frankly, the concern I had is the previous director uh, reflected poorly on our state of Ohio by uh, his practices, whether it was hiring practices or sue and settle schemes or frankly, ways to make companies settle even in spite of the law. So providing clarity, not just for the consumers, but for the businesses that are trying in, uh, in their best efforts to serve consumers. So thank you for that. I truly believe um, that, that a lot of it does go back to consumer education in terms of financial education. And uh, you can really see the difference that it makes. Uh, certainly, compounding interest has changed the world. It changes the world for all sorts of people, whether that's working for good uh, to accumulate wealth over time or working for bad uh, to see people get on the wrong side of that debt. So appreciate your efforts there. I want to highlight a couple things as you sit in a role that was created in a way to kind of sit over top of, um, you know, broadly things that are already uh, bad practices in every single state. So it's not like most of the things that I'm hearing people criticize you for here today aren't against the law in every state in the United States of America, and attorneys generals are prosecuting people for the criminal activity there. And so systemically, as you look across the entire financial sector of the United States from the federal level, I'm just curious, what position are you in to assess um, a couple things? So when you look at things that can pass as a member of the minority, maybe we could study something, uh, something that's bipartisan. So when you look at faster payments and you look at FinTech and all the uh, innovation that's out there and now the Fed's uh, newfound interest in, per in uh, the Fed itself taking a role in faster payments, do you have a way to assess um, the transaction costs that consumers are paying just as a means of payment, whether that's uh, credit card fees or processing fees, money transmittal fees, but all the ways that people would move money between one another, how many fees are they paying? I, I can tell you, Congressman, that I can't, of course, answer that quite direct question at this particular moment, but the Atlantic Fed does do extensive uh, research and, and surveys on payments, and they, they kind of have the center of gravity on, on some of this research. So we have been working with them on making sure that we're looking at what's happening in this marketplace and understanding, again, the dynamics. Uh, I, I, if I go too much further, I, I probably I, I may misspeak, but we can get back to you with some of the summaries of the research and what we've seen. Perfect. And one of the other areas that I think is a shared a uh, sense of concern in Congress and across the United States is consumers' data. So we've, we've really failed in Congress, uh, in my opinion, to do our duty and provide uh, a data privacy uh, regulation, a standard that's really foundational, really, uh, to our, I mean, it's supposed to be there in a sense, uh, the right to privacy in the Fourth Amendment. Uh, but as times have changed, we haven't really updated it for the electronic era, for sure. And uh, we've seen companies that have collected and monetized lots of personally identifiable information, and unfortunately, sometimes compromise that data. Uh, so as you look at how we know companies have monetized the data, when that data is compromised, what are the impacts on consumers? Would you be in a position to assess that? So we, we have with respect to a couple of different enforcement actions, but I, I can't say there are some uh, lines amongst the federal agencies over authorities in this space. For example, Congress explicitly took the GLBA safeguards uh, you know, out of the Bureau's purview. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has that responsibility in addition with the prudential regulators. Uh, but I will say holistically, certainly, we are looking at what's happening in this space and, and we are certainly doing our part. Perhaps from the consumer's perspective. Yeah. So thank you for that. And then I think the last thing is just in the, the interest of the QM rule and the upcoming piece, you know, you're not yet into the rulemaking, but you're talking about going towards it. Certainly that says there are things that you have concerns about the rule as it has exists today. And, you know, I guess what kinds of things are you and the staff there trying to balance as you look at a review of this? The interest, things that are broken and things that you want to safeguard and clarify. I, uh, well, that's a definitely a longer question probably that, that I can answer in a shorter period of time. I would say very clearly carrying out the, the law, there is a requirement to, to have an ability to repay and how that's determined. Thank you.
The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is recognized for five minutes. Hi, uh, Director, thank you so much for being here. Um, as you know, and I've talked to you about this in the last uh, hearings, um, but uh, I represent a, a beautifully diverse community and lending practices are a really critical issue for my district. In 2016, I don't know if you saw the study that found black applicants in Wayne County, um, Michigan communities, were almost twice as likely to be denied conventional home purchase loans um, compared to white applicants. Um, the same study conducted by the Center for Investigative uh, Reporting found that Detroit ranked 44th out of 48 communities nationally where black people were denied loans at a higher rate than their white counterparts. So I do believe there's something happening there. We used to have 70% home ownership in the city. Now it's down to 50%, uh, and we continue to see that decline. So fair lending is important. Do you agree? I do. How long have you been in your position? 14 months. 14 months. Uh, and so I was asking about, you know, how the investigative process goes, and I think it looks like you all opened about 32 fair lending super, no, uh, cases or supervisor exams in 2016, and then the number fell to 24 in 2019. Uh, Is that correct? Just 24 cases that were open? Uh, I will stipulate that you're probably looking at a report that's not in front of me, so okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, can see Same here, right it's just is something that's in front of me. That's why I wanted to confirm. So, Director, after reviewing the fair lending you know, enforcement actions taken by the agency thus far uh, listed on the website, it appears that there have been no cases where CFP under your leadership has found any company violating the Equal, Cre Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Is that correct? They, there have not been any public enforcement actions on ECOA. That is correct. So there was one on HMDA that is, is very much a, a fair what's lending HMDA? case. What's HMDA? the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, That's so okay. it is, again, a fair lending law. So out of all of those, I mean, what happens to those? Are these complaints, do they go through an intake process and then you all review? How long does that take? And then you decide we're not gonna pursue any enforcement? Our enforcement case is actually the decision to open an enforcement case is done actually at the investi you know the, the lowest level. Yeah. Uh, we are taking in, you know, looking at research, we are looking at whistleblower feedback, so director, we're looking at complaints. You don't even open up a case until there's really a cause right at the beginning, right? I mean, that's when it's not like somebody can call and it's automatic. There has to be some wrongdoing that make you all take a, a stronger look or a closer look to it. Uh, certainly the allegations, yes. Yes. Um, so according to CFBP's annual fair lending report issued it last June, um, and I know you've been asked about this, but this is really important because that's why you exist, right, in, in accountability. The five regulatory agencies that make up um, the Federal Financial Institution Examination Council, including the CFPB, made about 20, 20 referrals in 2016 to the Department of Justice around enforcement, accountability, making sure we're protecting our families. And these were potential violations to the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. However, there was only one in 2018 to DOJ and none in 2019? Uh, I believe that is the case, although there might have been one. Um, the, the bottom line here, and again, to get to the, the key here, I am looking at this very closely, mm -hmm. not just because Congress has asked me about it, but because I care about it and because it's important. I am looking at understanding better how we're getting information on which we can base the cases. And one thing that uh, we are exploring actually is around whistleblowers. Uh, we do not get, the cases that are most successful in this area do tend to come from that source. Absolutely. In general. I heard from and a, so, yeah, so, yeah. So understanding from how a, we incentivize that kind yeah. of reporting and that kind of insight about what's and happening. How do you protect inside. them too? And I think CFPB yes. has a responsibility. But so yeah, I'd like to, I'm, I'm looking very that worked, carefully at that. Yeah, to see what I we think can do. I believe someone from Wells Fargo did come before this committee and was taught to give a higher interest rate to someone that had an accent that was Spanish speaking. And they and what's interesting and and I want you to know this, Director, the number of lawsuits against these banks I haven't. I mean, they're. They're consistent to what I've been hearing from residents about being denied access to mortgage loans. But the government's not doing its part, because not all of my residents can afford to bring a lawsuit. They rely on CFPB to do its job and responsibility to push back against discriminatory practices or practices that are, in essence, in violation uh, of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. 
So I, I'm asking you, you know, you want to take a closer look, but I think the chairwoman and others, we're having the continued hearings because we don't feel like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing and holding them accountable. People deserve a home and they deserve access. If they're working hard, they shouldn't be denied. Thank you so much. The uh, gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Director Craninger, thanks for being here. Appreciate your work. Um, a question. So the Bureau has made announcements around the appropriate use of compliance aids and how the Bureau intends to make clear to entities how they can comply with the rules. So one area where the Bureau stands is still far from clear is the RESPA Section 8. Uh, in particular, the Bureau's confusing 2015 uh, bulletin, I believe that predates you, but the, the 2015 bulletin on marketing services agreements under RESPA. So are you aware of this? It, it appears that you might be, but are you aware of this and do you intend to revisit that bulletin? Uh, Congressman, I am aware of that bulletin and it is, uh, it, we are looking at what we can do on this issue because it is complicated. Um, and, and I know that's not a fantastic answer here, but, but looking at what makes sense. And we've had a number of issues in the mortgage space that, that just rose to uh, higher priority in terms of moving out on them. But, but this is very much on my mind in terms of something that we need to uh, provide greater clarity on. One thing that we have done is using our innovation policies, addressing some of the challenges, at least around steering. Uh, we have issued a no action letter to housing counseling agencies and to protect uh, financial institutions that support them uh, associated with similar uh, issues around RESPA. Uh, but we'll continue to look at what we can do to provide better clarity here. So just to be clear, it is worth, it's confusing enough and you've got enough feedback. It's worth recalling it, revising it, and reissuing it. Uh, certainly addressing it, but I will say recalling it is, is a, a, it becomes more complicated in terms of what to replace it with. Understood. Thank you. Uh, so secondly, I want to touch on the CFPB Consumer Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that the advisory board is a group of experts on consumer protection, consumer financial products or services, community development, um, fair lending, civil rights, underserved communities, communities that have been significantly impacted by higher priced mortgage loans, a lot of the things we've mentioned. Uh, but given the focus, I imagine there is a very diverse uh, market intelligent and expertise on that advisory board. Is that true so far? Yes. Okay. So with respect to members of the board, uh, a number of banks that are in my district that I have the privilege to represent, they're relatively large in size, but they still represent both rural and urban communities. Uh, they're constantly working to broaden their relationships with these LMI, low to moderate income communities uh, where they serve. So my question to you, uh, Director, is this. So why are more bankers that work at those larger institutions not represented, to my understanding, uh, on this advisory board? And my thought is that it would be uh, appropriate since they're key players in this LMI space. And do you have any thoughts on that? And do you add, intend to add any more in the future? Uh, yes. So I can tell you our Consumer Advisory Board has a rotating membership two-year term, but every year we have some new members. So we actually have an application period open now. Uh, we do look for diversity. Uh, we do have a, a mid-sized bank represented right now on the cab. Um, I can tell you though, you know, there are some, there are many avenues by which we engage with different entities. And the, part of the calculus is, you know, who have we not, who do we not reach on a regular basis? Who do we not hear from on a regular basis? How do we engage that? Uh, that voice and that entity. And so those are the things that we think about uh, and maintaining diversity and of course the statutory requirements for the types of representatives that need to be on the cab. So that, that gives you some sense of, of how we think about that, but encourage applications for sure. Thank you. How many members are on that advisory board? I think the cab is 14 off the top of my head. Give or take. And how many, you said there's some slots open now for open for application? Half, Half, Half are open. Mm -hmm. Very good. And is the 14 a number at your discretion? It is, but it's, it what it's what makes it manageable. In addition, we have a community banking advisory mm -hmm. committee and the credit union advisory committee. So we, and we try to bring them together. Uh, so we have those different perspectives brought together. And so it gets to be, a, you know, again, a larger group of people to think about. Thank you. Uh, Director, I have a, about another half minute plus I've been yielded a little bit of extra time. Uh, do you have anything that you wish to clarify or, or go back and revisit? 
I do, I do think that the fair lending question is, is an important one, and it is one that I am taking very seriously. The, the ability to understand um, how we get information about what's happening in the marketplace. I do want to assure Congresswoman Tlaib that when we get complaints, we address them uh, to at least the, the best of our ability, understand that the financial institution gets an answer back to the consumer. So we do have that mechanism, but we're also analyzing those complaints to say, what does that tell us about what's happening and should we take further action? Very good. Uh, I yield back. Thank you, Chair. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Director Graninger, for being here. Uh, in, in 2017, your predecessor, Mr. Mulvaney, uh, decided uh, that the CFPB would no longer write rules to govern the practices of the large private sector financial service companies that service student loans for 45 million Americans, even though the Bureau has the authority to do so. I recently authored legislation, the Student Borrower Protection Act, to set these standards as part of the Truth in Lending Act and require CFPB to finally take action to halt abuses by these companies. Uh, the legislation is important and borrowers deserve these protections, but CFPB doesn't need uh, to wait for Congress, and our work doesn't excuse your failure to use your existing authority to protect student loan borrowers. Uh, you've been at the Bureau now for more than a year. Uh, you've had the chance to hire a new top official to help direct the Bureau's approach on, on student loans. So can you um, explain why the Bureau is no longer planning to write rules on student loan servicing? So we, we have a rule on the larger participants and supervising them in the student servicer space. We are working with the Department of Education on, on how best to do that together. So they're going to oversee their contract terms, and we will oversee federal consumer financial law. Uh, we are engaged in enforcement actions. I can assure you of that. So we are not absent. Um, and we are also engaged in education of consumers to try to improve their understanding and, and uh, ability to operate in this space as well. Uh, so I do, I, I can tell you one more thing, because I, I know I don't want to take your time, Congresswoman, but we are sending detailees over to Ed so we can design that, that supervisory program together, and I am excited about that development uh, to really make this clear in this space. So I, I would appreciate that uh, response. I would certainly encourage you to use the authority that you have uh, and would uh, certainly offer to work with you on the, on the legislation that I mentioned to get protection uh, for these borrowers. It's really important to so many students uh, across the country. Uh, last fall, I asked Director Calibria about concerning changes uh, the GSEs made to their affordable lending programs, Fannie Mae's Home Ready and Freddie Mac's Home Possible. Uh, previously, these programs had income limits of 100% of the area median uh, income uh, for the poverty's lo property's location, but now the income limits are 80% of AMI. Um, uh, many borrowers are, are precluded from using these programs to simply, to sensibly buy homes with conventional loan down payments and are ineligible for the LLPA waiver and reduced mortgage insurance uh, premiums. Uh, so, um, are you concerned that, that a pricing-based uh, QM definition and the changes to the GSE's affordable programs could shift significant volume to the FHA and, like many borrowers, out of the conventional market? Okay. I, I can tell you I, I am concerned about the current ability to repay qualified mortgage rulemaking and precisely the outcome you're talking about. The, the patch uh, for the GSEs, of course, expires in, in January, and what that would lead to is a 43% debt-to-income ratio hardline requirement, which we know is going to be a challenge for that population. At the same time, balancing that against what was clearly in the Dodd-Frank Act around ability to repay, verifying income, considering debt to income ratio, and kind of what the best way to go about this is. Um, that is why I said I would propose a, a pricing threshold uh, as an alternative, but we're going to take comment on that. That rule will be out in May, and very much interested in what comes back. But this, this, there are a lot of um, issues at, you know, wait to weigh here, Congresswoman, and I also encourage Congress 
uh, to, to weigh in on this as well in terms of the policy objectives that we're trying to seek here and how best to, to weigh them. Um, that I will move forward with rulemaking, but in the meantime, if Congress sought to act, uh, that would be welcome. So do you agree that it is arbitrary for borrowers to be directed into specific loan programs uh, based simply off of regulatory arbitrage or, or different uh, QM standards? Uh, I would say there's a lot to pull apart in, in the answer to that question, but I could tell you there, they, there are policy issues at play here that we're that need to be weighed uh, with affordable housing interests as well. And so thinking about that is, is the important part of this. All right, thank you for you, thank you very much. I'll yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director, for being here uh, again. Um, I wanna touch on the QM rule again. I know we've, we've talked about it a lot. Um, my perspective is, you know, whatever rule ultimately is adopted has enormous implications uh, for the housing finance market, um, housing availability in particular, uh, because so many things kind of fall off of the decision uh, that, you, that you make on QM. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with just a basic question. When you think through the rule, um, have you done a lot of analysis on safety and soundness and kind of what the implications are uh, of the shift that you're proposing with respect to the housing finance market um, and how stable it is. Is that an analysis that you all have done? Uh, I, I can tell you that's, that's a little out of our, our purview on this, but at the same time, we are absolutely looking at what market impacts would, would have, you know, would there would be from uh, various options in this space. And we've taken in a lot of comment on what the market impacts would be. We do talk to the prudential regulators, at least in terms of, uh, to your point, safety and soundness issues that affect those institutions that they regulate. Uh, so that is that from that standpoint, it's part of the consideration. Okay, so fair to say it's it's more done in consultation with the prudential regulators, but not an expertise that is in the CFPB. Uh, that is fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I think frankly, like that's a concern for me, right? Because because you are going to make ultimately make that decision with input, right? And I'm, I'm sure it'll be done thoughtfully. Um, but again, those implications are, are pretty substantial. Um, and so to, to not, not have that expertise in-house actively thinking through those implications, um, I think is, is something we, frankly, as a committee should, should be thinking about. Um, secondly, so next question, what analysis, if any, have you done with respect to uh, what the proposed rule shift will mean for low and moderate income borrowers and the uh, availability of credit. Yes, so that, that is the heart of the matter. Um, and I will say that there's been a lot of discussion around congressional intent, uh, frankly, right. with respect to Title 14 uh, in the Dodd-Frank Act and what uh, ability to repay would mean or could mean uh, with respect to that. And so that's also my concern around uh, just allowing qualified mortgages to revert to 43% debt to income ratio to particularly around the appendix Q requirements today as to how you calculate that. Got it. Um, so that's you know a lot of things to, to unpack in this space, but we are certainly looking at that. Um, but you know the law is first and foremost uh, and, and remaining uh, true to those requirements in Title 14 is, is where we're starting. Thank you. Um, and then now I wanna shift to uh, alternative data with respect to AI, machine learning, and again, extending credit um, to folks who currently have very, a lot of difficulty uh, accessing the credit markets. Um, as you think through uh, that issue, the alternative data machine learning issue, um, what expertise currently exists inside the CFPB on machine learning technology specifically? Uh, do you have experts on machine learning on staff? How are you going about analyzing these? Uh, I would posit, and I've, I personally have spent a decent amount of time on this issue in my federal career. Uh, I would posit there aren't many experts in the US government who, on machine learning and, and how it works. Uh, but I would say that we do have a number of people that at least understand it. Yep. And, and we are looking at, again, the implications or what other capabilities we should grow to, to even get a deeper understanding. Okay, um, so would you, uh, Kind of judge the capacity at CFPB to be adequate in, in this regard? It's not a gotcha question, I'm, I'm sincerely. I, no, I would say, you know, it's always something we got to keep an eye on. Uh, okay. I do have some folks in, in our uh, TNI area, the CIO's area, okay. that have a, a decent um, 
understanding of it. Okay, um, great. Because I think as certainly as the economy evolves and these become a bigger part of lending decisions, yes. um, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we have that expertise in government, or at least have access to yes. it. it. Doesn't necessarily have to be in house, right? Um, but but certainly uh, need to be considered. And then with my final 30 seconds, um, I, I want to encourage you. Uh, on all the things you're doing with respect to financial education. I think the best form of consumer protection is education and training uh, and making sure that people can protect themselves uh, and are self-sufficient in that regard. And, and I know you are doing a lot of work on it. I know others on this committee on both sides of the aisle are committed to it. Um, and I just encourage you and thank you for all that work. Uh, and with that, I will yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters, for your continued commitment to oversight and diligent consumer protection. Uh, Director Craniger, um, just in the interest of time, if you could answer these, as many of these questions as yes or no, I'd appreciate it. I'm hoping uh, just for a simple yes or no. Do you think that choosing to attend a historically black college or university, or HBCU, should mean paying more on a mortgage, a credit card, or any other type of loan? Uh, no, not in and of itself. Okay. Uh, so the, what I'm getting at in the issue that I have here, and I'm, I'm still not sure I really understand that, that question because you sort of well, you're couched it. So attendance, attendance at an HBCU. So again, I'm, I'm yes. no. That's, Do you that's, think that choosing to attend an HBCU should mean paying more on a mortgage, credit card, or any other type of loan, yes or no? And I said no, not in and of itself as one fact, it's not a factor in the process. As a, well, as a well, I have data that, that challenges uh, that which you uh, assert. Uh, the issue I have, Director, is that Upstart, a lending company that your agency effectively re-endorsed through a no action letter in 2019, says on their own website that this is exactly what is happening to students who choose to attend a historically black college and university. According to research out this week by the Student Borrower Protection Center, an HBCU graduate is identical in every way to a graduate of a non-minority serving institution, and yet they wind up paying more for their loans. So no amount of access to credit makes that okay. I ask for unanimous consent to submit to the record the Student Borrower Protection Center's report entitled Educational Redlining. Without objection, such is the order. Thank you, Madam Chair. The center created several hypothetical applicant profiles to test various credit scoring algorithms. One case found that controlling for all factors, a 24-year-old applying to refinance a $30,000 loan with Upstart would pay very different amounts depending on where they went to school. Director, have you seen this report? I was aware of it. I have not yet read it. I can tell you that disparities in African American lending is something that uh, is of great interest to me. I can, uh, Congressman Clay uh, departed, but he and Congressman Cleaver at the last hearing actually alerted me to one particular study that found that there is an inexplicable 11% disparity uh, there and, and that is something that I've already asked our Office of Research to dig okay. into. So we'll take this I mean, one into account. Well, I hope you'll read this article this. specifically from the Student Borrower Protection Center on educational redlining. Um, until you've read it, I'll just share with you. Can you guess how much more this borrower, the hypothetical scenario that I offered a moment ago, it would pay if she was a Howard graduate versus a graduate of NYU? I can't pause. Okay, so she would pay nearly thirty-five hundred dollars more over five years. The Howard grad would also be slammed with seven hundred and twenty-nine dollars in origination fees that her NYU counterpart wouldn't. Do you agree that this is problematic? Uh, again, as as a factor in and of itself. Yes or no? On its face, based on what I'm do. sharing, do you agree that's problematic? Uh, it's really simple. I agree, it's problematic. It's okay. something that we so need to So given understand. these findings, are you willing to rescind your agency's no action letter allowing Upstart to use educational criteria in their underwriting algorithms that they are also licensing out? I can tell you that they can explain with respect to, you know, what is happening there as to Director what Director are you willing to rescind it... your agency's no action letter? No, and I can tell you why. Moving on. I'm trying to do. The report also found that Wells Fargo continues to disappoint when it comes to equitable treatment of customers. 
I want to note to proponents of community college and vocational schools on both sides of the aisle that the pattern of more favorable payment terms extends to graduates of four-year universities as well. Specifically, a community college borrower would pay over $1,130 more on a $10,000 loan than a student with the exact credit profile in a bachelor degrees program. So yes or no, do you agree borrowers should have protections against this type of discrimination? Uh, Congresswoman, I've already stipulated to you that we want to understand precisely what is happening yes in some of these no. studies. And do you have agree pledged to on its face? This is very simple. Do you agree borrowers? Yeah, none of it is very simple. Should have simple. this These is simple. Complex. Should borrowers have protections against discrimination? They oh, are yes. being treated differently based upon Consumers attending do have a community college or a four-year college or a historically black college and university. The actions of your agency thus far don't suggest you actually do agree. Thank you, Madam Chair. The gentlewoman's uh, time has expired. The witness is requested to provide an answer in writing for the record. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is recognized for five <clears throat> minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Director uh, Kreininger for uh, being here again. Uh, over the past uh, several weeks, we've focused a lot in this committee on the Community Reinvestment Act, the CRA. I'm concerned that the recent proposal advanced by the FDIC and OCC weakened the CRA objective of supporting investment in low and moderate income communities. FDIC Director uh, Marty Grunberg descended from the proposal, as you know, warning that it would, quote, fundamentally undermine, end of quote, the CRA by relying on a single metric that does not take into account the quality and character of the bank's activities and its responsiveness to local needs. As a member of the FDIC board, you voted to advance Comptroller Odding's proposal. Why did you vote for it? Uh, I can tell you, Congressman, that, that uh, precisely the opposite is the intent. The intent is to drive greater transparency and clarity over those investments and to drive greater investments, including with hard metrics. But it is a proposal, and so I voted to have a proposal published for comment, and we welcome those comments. Well, I am disappointed, I must uh, tell you, because Chicago is the birthplace of the CRA, and I've worked on community reinvestment for years as an urban planner, as a matter of fact, I knew Gail Sincata, who was a champion of the CRA. We should not be moving forward with the proposed rule that allows banks to pass their CRA exams with a handful of flashy high dollar investments. One way that we could strengthen rather than weaken the CRA is by informing examiners with a richer set of data about small business lending. On that subject, I asked you a question last year about the CFPB's implementation of Section 1071 of Dodd-Frank, which requires financial institutions to compile and report information to the CFPB about credit applications made by women-owned, minority-owned, and small businesses. You told me then that you were committed to implementation of that section following a symposium series on that uh, topic. Can you please provide me with an update? Yes, Congressman. We had the symposium. We, we uh, covered a lot of the very challenging issues and how to implement this effectively. Um, and we are currently pulling together the proposal for small business impact. And that's, that's a brief of process. Uh, we have said that we would issue something by the fall that will launch that Sabrifa process, which is the next required step towards rulemaking. So September? Yeah, uh, okay. fall, yes. Would, would, would you commit to developing a rulemaking on Section 1071 that adheres to the intent of the Dodd-Frank Act? Uh, yes, Congressman. Is that your, okay, I appreciate that the Consumer Bureau released some data in January showing some general trends about small business data since the Great Recession. But that is not what the law mandated. When will Section 1071 be implemented uh, per the law? Uh, you know, and I like, I like the report, but that's not what the law requires. So in September or so, we will see that? Uh, you will see the first proposal. 
in, in the fall, yes. Okay. So when you were before this committee last year, I also asked you about the problems of student debt, an enormous constraint that is affecting our entire economy. The student debt crisis affects young people all over this country. It disproportionately affects people in working class communities and of color, like the ones that I represent. We can't address issues like this if we don't have good, reliable data to inform us about the problem. Last March, I asked you if you intended to reinstate the MOUs that Director Cordery established with the Department of Education, and you said you would. So I was initially pleased to learn that a new MOU between the board and the Department of Education was recently announced. However, when I looked into the details, I was disappointed to find that the new agreement is limited. So what's the, what, what can we expect? The new agreement does address complaints, information sharing, and, and frankly is even more robust than the last one in terms of our ability to support uh, programmatic changes and considerations by the Department of Education. The second MOU with respect to how we're going to supervise or oversee the larger participants uh, in the federal student loan space, that MOU is not yet concluded. But we have an agreement with Ed. We're going to send some detailees over, and we're going to design a program to work on together. Will it approximate the quarterly MOU? Uh, I believe it's going to be better because we're going to go into these institutions together. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Virginia, Mrs. Wexton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Craninger, for joining us again. It's great to see you, as always. Um, I do want to talk a little bit more about these MOUs um, with the Department of Education, uh, and I want to go back to kind of just clarify the timeline of everything. Mm -hmm. Because between, I guess, uh, January of 2014 and August of 2017, CFPB and Department of Education were working in, under these two memoranda of understanding. Is that correct? I, I don't know precisely when they were signed, but I, I stipulate you have a date in front of you, so I'll say yes. That sounds about right, right? Okay, yes. good. So they were, there were, and there were two of them. One of them was the sharing MOU, and the other was the super, supervisory and oversight MOU, correct? Yes. But then those were terminated on, on or about August 31st, 20, 2017, correct? Yes. Okay, now that predates your time at the CFPB, right? Yes. Okay. So in the, the Department of Education in its letter said that the CFPB is using the department's data to expand its jurisdiction into areas that Congress never envisioned. Do you agree that they were doing that? Uh, I'm not gonna to talk about what the secretary thought or didn't think. No, no, uh, I'm, I I'm sorry, you. I'm sorry. I, I was asking if you agreed that, that, that the CFPB was expanding into areas well, that it shouldn't have. One thing that hasn't come out clearly is that the Dodd-Frank Act very specifically talks about the CFPB's role in private education loans. And the CFPB has the ability to expand supervision by rulemaking, so we expanded into larger but participants. Dodd Frank in the also requires the bureau re requires the bureau to, in Title Ten to implement and, where applicable, enforce federal consumer law. Does it not? Yes, but we're talking specifically about supervision and the ability to examine entities, which does have a lot of um, of different requirements in the Act. So we did issue a rulemaking. And we are actually, we have the authority to examine larger participants in the federal student loan space. And that's precisely the issue around which there uh, is So you have the authority to examine them. Do you have the uh, authority to open supervisory events? I, that is the same thing. Just okay, to be, yes. just checking. Yes, fair. So, okay, very good. Now, in their 2017 letter uh, terminating the agreement, the Department of Education made it pretty clear that they took exception to the CFPB unilaterally expanding its oversight role to include the department's contracted federal student loan servicers. The department has full oversight responsibility for federal student loans. Do you agree that that is still the case? Well, they, they have their own authorities. We do have the authority and responsibility, which is pr precisely the one that we're finalizing an agreement around to supervise the larger participants in the federal student loan space. And I know that is the heart of the concern that is in that letter, 
uh, but we're working through from, how we can do that from together. From October 2017 to now, have you have not you have not had that kind of clarity, right? We continue to enforce in this space. We continue to engage in education. We continue to deal with complaints in this space. But yes, there, there was a lack of clarity around the supervisory responsibilities that we have now since clarified. But if you, but if you, have, no jointly, if you have no memorandum of understanding that sets forth the supervisory obligations between yourselves and Department of Education, how could you, how could you enforce under, under that um, scheme? Uh, the, the MOU is specifically around examination, not around enforcement. So okay. we have ongoing litigation uh, in this space. But what I very much want to get to is an agreement around supervision. We are going to so detail some that's, folks. Uh, that's, I, know that, I know that in, based on your previous answers that there's no real timeline for that and you're working on it and all that kind of stuff. And I know you'll come before us again, so maybe we'll get some more information in the future. But I want to talk about some of the answers that you gave about specific events in your previous testimony um, on, in writing after our uh, event. Um, how many fair lending supervisory events did the Consumer Bureau open in 2019, in FY 2019? You answered 24 fair lending supervisory events out of 131 total events. Question 14, how many supervisory events did the Consumer Bureau open in FY 2019 against student loan servicers? The answer was, the information requested constitutes con confidential supervisory information. What's confidential about that? So I, I have been round and round with my staff about this. There's a desire for transparency. There's a desire to protect uh, confidential information. The Bureau in the past, I, I'm sorry, Madam Chairwoman, if I could finish, it would be incredibly does helpful. A, does the gentlewoman uh, may, request may, an additional? May she, may yes. she answer the Please question? Please answer, you may answer. The only supervisory event numbers that the Bureau has ever released in the past are the total number and the numbers for fair lending. We have not provided any numbers for any other uh, type of exam, and that is something I am looking at. Uh. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The witness is requested to provide an answer in writing for the record. Thank you. I'd like to thank Director Craninger for her time today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions to the chair, which will be forwarded to Director Craninger for her response. I ask you, Director Craninger, to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.